Today we're going to be picking up where I left off, basically getting the rest of the apron in, um, not just the purple, but also the whites that are in here. So we're going to cordon everything off the same way we did up here so that only our golds are showing through, but all of the whites and all of the violets are in place. Uh, and then based on the time, um, I may jump in and do a few other kind of knickknacks just to kind of tighten things up. Um, but we're definitely going to be shutting down at four today. Steve Moran just said, just promoted you on my live sketch last night. Thank you. Thank you. He hopes all is well. Yeah, Steve, everything is going well. Um, staying busy, obviously the school's not open right now, but um, everything is moving along. Portrait's coming along nicely. I'm, uh, I'm getting to just kind of stroll through it at a casual pace, which is usually not the case. Um, I hope everything is well on your end as well. <clears throat> yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm just going to give it a couple of minutes to let everybody let everybody that's jumping in jump in before I get started. Again, it's more of the same. Um, at least for now, it's gonna be like color by number to knock this out. Um, so I've gotta get the white figured out as well. There's quite a bit of white in the apron. And I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do both at the same time. Like I'll knock out this white and then I'll finish the purple, knock out, I'll do the purple over here, knock out the white and then finish the bottom. That way I'm not kind of, you know, having to dangle my hand I mean, I can do it, but if I can rest my hand in some places, it's just easier. The mall stick is great, but it's not the perfect fit for every situation. So I'll use it in the places where it sits best, and I'll use my hand, if I plan properly, where it fits best. Um, you also notice, if you look at this, lighter and darker areas in here, it's kind of looking funny. So that's drying and sinking in. Um, so before I do my third pass, I will have to do another isolating layer on this to bring all of these things back up to their to their original color and value. Um, again, not a big deal, the isolating layer. You don't want to get into the habit of four, five, six passes like that. Um, but two passes, not a big deal. Um, again, you want to use the smallest number that you can, but you do need to be able to see what the color and value of the painting is, and especially something big on this, it takes so long to get the canvas covered that there are going to be areas, big open areas that are completely sunken in that you're not going to be able to make sense of. And so there are, there are places along the process where you're going to want to isolate what's underneath, bring it back up to that finish, that original luster, so that you can then make educated decisions about what's going where, um, you know, and how it relates to the things that were already down. So again, I will do another isolating layer. Um, after the face is done. So probably Wednesday, after I finish the face, I'll let it dry and maybe Saturday I'll come in and I'll hit this with an isolating layer, which is gonna, again, lock everything down underneath. Um, it'll lock everything in place and it'll bring everything up to its finished luster. And then on top of that, more likely than not, I will just be doing the finishing work, uh, what we would think of as stage three in speed painting. Um, being that that's my goal, that on Wednesday, when I finish, that everything is in place and ready to be sealed for stage three. I do have some work I've got to get done in here and in here. Um, to, and there may be a couple of other places where I might do a few things. I might even go in with a small brush and scribble in some of the more extreme shadows in the jewelry, um, simply because when I do my, when I do my, I want to be able to do the jewelry almost in highlights alone. I don't want to have to go in and do both shadows and highlights in one pass. So I might go in and start putting in some of the deeper shadows into the jewelry. That'll be done very, very thinly as a glaze and it'll be a small brush and they'll, they'll mostly be linear marks. Um, again, they're mechanically made, they're, they're made by machines, so they're going to be crisp, clean edged. But I can go in and I can put those things in They'll be see-through. It'll probably be um, a darker version of this color, much like I did in here um, yesterday, these darker shades, like this to this. Probably be something like that, maybe a little bit darker um, for, to, to explain some of, the, some of the bolder, harder edges that are, that are um, in relief. 
and then all I have to do is drop in my lights on top. And again, same down in here, there are some areas where I'll be able to go in and drop in a few things where there are gonna be the lights, when I put the lights in, what's down already won't be dark enough to feel like a deep recess. So I'll put a few marks in that'll, that'll hold that space for me. So again, I only have to move the painting in the direction of light, not in the direction of things being darker. Yes. Um, question from Rebecca and Nicholas. They're wondering if you did any Dungeons and Dragons or Game of Thrones illustrations. Um, I've never done any work for Dungeons and Dragons. And though I never did any work for Game of Thrones, I owned a publishing company um, for almost 10 years. Um, and we did the limited edition Game of Thrones. So I, I had the, uh, the, and so those books were like four or five color plates and 72 hand-drawn um, illustrations that go inside the book, gold gilding and that kind of stuff. Uh, but I had the uh, I had the privilege of working with George R. R. Martin for almost six years on that project. Um, so so even though I've not done paintings for either of those, I have worked on Game of Thrones in a in a, a pretty extensive manner. Um, I need one second. You just need to grab something. So what I did is I went and I found my old palette with the white I made for the gloves, because clearly it's not white. Not only is it not white um, from a value standpoint, um, so it's, it's like a value two, maybe two and a half instead of a value one, but it's also a color. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that the white that I'm making down here falls in line with this. And though I can test it against the painting, it's better to test it against the actual paint that I mix. So um, I brought that over so I can square that away. And again, just going to mix a, a puddle of paint. Um, I'm looking at it just, just to get a sense of how it reads. Does the white in the apron read at the same value and color as the white of the gloves, the white of the shirt? And I'm thinking it's, it's pretty close. Again, I'll be able to make minor adjustments to it later on. Um, I'll probably nudge it the tiniest bit darker than the gloves. I mean, barely perceptible. Um, but I'll probably do that just so that the gloves feel like they are in front of this without me having to glaze this and push it back. I don't like doing a lot of, I don't, I definitely don't like doing corrective work on things that are so light. They, t they have a habit of grabbing a hold of paint and they, they, get, they get ugly fast. Um, most of my glazing I like to do in the transition areas, not in the bolder lights. I mean, I work in the lights, but I like to work in the transition areas. And so these big open fields of white, I want to try to stay away from glazing them if I can. I'll accent them, but I don't want to shift an entire thing that's white, a half value dark, or switch a color on it on white if I can avoid it, and rather mix it on the palette in the opaque pass. So I'm just going to take a minute. Um, I'm going to mix this, mix this up. And again, it's mostly gray. It's a little bit of a little bit of a blue hue to it, but I want to make sure I'm getting in the right value. You know, it's funny. Like even though I mixed it and I can I can see the color, the value that's here, it is in context here. This is sitting against this extreme red and these golds and these you know these kind of purples, and it's hard to see it for what it is. Also, this color and value is not solidly opaque you're seeing some of the gold through it. And so it, you're, there's no honest way to assess that the way it is in the painting. Um, it's easier to just use the paint. And again, all of these things. It would be so easy to just go, oh, well, that looks about right and kind of paint, but that causes problems. So for me, 
I take an extra minute. I don't throw my palettes away. I, I usually stack them until the painting is done. And just in case I need something, it's always sitting out there somewhere so that I can, I can access a color that I mixed earlier. Sure, and it's not even really for this, but should I scratch something like this and I need to do a repair, I can match the color exactly because I've already, I've still got the paint. This is gonna be harder to manage because you can see through it, it's contaminated and it's in, contaminated by what's underneath it because it's not completely solid, but it's also in context of all of these other colors and values. It's, it's a hard read and it's not that you can't do it, but especially as a student, why would you put yourself through that when you just, if you just keep the color that you mix, you can replicate it on your palette in a one-to-one -one clean scenario. And again, this is just an idea like when you're working, there are easy ways to do things and there are hard ways to do things. There are ways of doing things that put you at risk and there are things that you can do for the same, for the same intended goal that don't put you at risk. So why would you take the risky road? It doesn't make sense. But I'll tell you that most students, they never calculate this stuff and they constantly take the more dangerous path. And again, the idea that a painting is ruined not by one catastrophic mistake, but by a bunch of little mistakes, those are the little mistakes. So always try to figure out ways to keep your, paint, your painting and your process organized in such a way that there are as few variants, there's as few chaos and um, things of a random nature creeping into your work as you go. And again, I know that I'm potentially going to be glazing over all of these whites at some point. Doesn't give me, it doesn't, doesn't, um, just because I know I'm going to be doing that doesn't mean that I want to also just kind of let this be 85% of what it can be. I want it to be a perfect match, right? Because that eliminates more work here later on. I take an extra 30 seconds or even a minute or two minutes here. I never have to touch the color value here again hopefully. But if I know this is not perfect when I put it down, I'm guaranteed, guaranteed to have to go back and rework it. And it's possible that the reworking will mean making another color and overpainting it completely as an opaque. Or it could mean that I have to glaze it, but if I have to glaze it, I've got to go around all the details that are down. Easier to just be precise at this stage. Mixing the paint is the safest place that you're going to work because it doesn't impact the painting until you take it from the palette to the canvas. So if you can spend a few extra minutes at the palette and resolve the issues there, or in many of them there, you won't have to deal with them in the painting. And so I've actually mixed this to be just the slightest bit darker than the glove. Tiny, tiny bit. I can see the difference on the palette, but it's super subtle. It looks about the same. It's maybe a third or a quarter of a value darker. It is barely perceptibly darker. In this state, it actually looks lighter because this is showing darker stuff through it, where this is solidly opaque. But when I put it on down here, it's going to show through the same way. starting the whites up in here. I just want to make sure the painting is dry. It's not, it's actually not dry. So I'm going to be careful not to put the, the photograph on the, uh, on the actual wet areas of the painting. Scissors around here somewhere. So I'm just gonna, so this is how the, the photographs wind up being cut down. Um, 
I'm cutting away the stuff that I don't need. So I'm gonna be working in here. This is already done. Um, I've got all of my purple and all of my gold in here. So I'm gonna cut it here, giving me a much smaller image to tack up on my canvas. And the truth is I don't need this either. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it, it doesn't matter if I cut it away, so I'm just gonna leave it. But this gives me a much smaller image. It allows me to get closer to where I'm working with my reference without me risking touching something that's wet. So, <clears throat> I'm gonna start with my white down in here. Again, all of, my, all of my shadows are gonna be left exactly as they are. They're gonna be done as transparent shadows. Um, for where everything is. And then I can be able to, I'm just gonna lay this in. This is gonna come up in here. Leaving room about, this is actually where the mark is, but I'm putting the edge here so that I can feather this out. So that's the shape. And there's a little bit of a shadow in this corner. So again, I want to get a little bit of medium in the paint. Not too much. I don't want it wet and sloppy. Just enough to loosen it up. It's very stiff the way it comes out of the tube, um, which is nice. One of the um, one of the really nice things that I like about um, the paint that we use, the um, Old Holland paint, is that the paint comes, because of how densely pigmented um, the paint is, meaning that there's a lot of pigment and less oil, um, the paint comes out very stiff to start relative to most other brands. It's not buttery um, like most other brands. It's much denser than that. And so if you want denser paint, you have it. And if you want the paint more buttery, then you just add medium to it. Uh, most other brands, they'll, they, they actually advertise the buttery nature of their paint, but the buttery nature of their paint means that if you want the stiffer paint for something, you don't have it. It's not in the tube that way, and there's no way to extract the oil. Um, or actually, let me say that. There are ways of extracting the oil, but it's a process. Why would you want to do that if you can just get the paint in, in that, that hardier state? Question. Yes. Are you still working with the same small angle brush? Um, I'm bouncing around. I've actually been using the same, uh, Daniel can attest because he's the one washing them, the same <laughs> small handful of brushes um, pretty much since I began the second pass. So the first pass started with a bunch of big brushes. I'm now down, I mean, there's a lot of intricate ins and outs here, so I'm not using big brushes, um, but I'm working with the same basically two brushes for application. Um, so the brushes that I'm using are like a number six filbert, or it's actually called a cat's tongue. They call it a filbert, but it's actually a cat's tongue. And then I'm using a, like a three eighth inch angled. These are the only brushes I'm actually applying paint with. And then I've got a small fan brush and a big fan brush for kind of cleaning stuff up. But that's about, right Daniel, that's about all I'm working with. Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, if I have a big open area, I might grab a larger angle brush. Um, but for the most part, um, I'm using like one set of these for shadows, one set of them for lights. I'll have one set of them now for the white and probably one set for the purple. And that'll get me through this. And then a fan brush for each, uh, a small fan brush for each and a big fan brush for each. 
So I'm basically you creating a set of brushes for each color or for each value if I'm only doing it. Like if I'm doing just the shadow and light on this, I can have one brush for the shadows and one brush for the lights. And that helps to keep them pure so that one doesn't start to get got, like eaten up by the other because there's a little bit of the lighter shade in the paint and it starts kind of frosting over the shadow or the shadow is a little grayer and it starts stripping away the color of the light. I put them down with two separate brushes and it, 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 keeps, them, it keeps them pristine. I'm just, just trying to soften that edge. I'm going to bulk this up, but I want to get that soft edge in first where I'm going to make a gradient. <clears throat> All right, so I establish the gradient and then I'll backfill it with something a little bit more solid. But I want to make sure that I get a nice soft edge in there. And again, this is just, this is vacant shadows. I can make this edge really kind of smoke it out, make it look literally like it fades into mist. Um, I can make it a little bit more abrupt. I can play with the edge. Again, the paint is pretty thin here. So I can play with the edge and make it what I want it to be. And then I can fill back in here, kind of fade up to it, almost like water lapping up against the shore. Um, this would be the far end of it, and then I would maybe lap it up here and kind of break break down that edge. And so, but I'm I'm utilizing the the density of the paint to um, establish my gradients by thinning the paint down a little bit, um, a little bit more in one place, and using it to just dissolve and be very much see through as it rolls over into the gold that's underneath. That allows me to establish a soft transition or gradient into the shadow. And then on the other side of it, I'm able to establish these really bold, um, stronger passages um, and sharper edges to explain the boundaries of the white. <clears throat> All right, so again in here, I just come in here. So I'll establish this is denser paint and it's less medium in it. And you can see how, you can see the difference in the densities this is see-through and this isn't. Um, I'll use up what's on the brush. And then once the brush starts to run a little bit lean on paint, then I'll go in here and dissolve this edge here. I won't allow it to creep up too much. I'm gonna keep it right where it is. But you can see the brush starts to run thin on paint. I'll wipe the brush and then here just, just kind of tap the edge until it looks like it's married to the thinner stuff above it. And there's my gradient. I'll go in with a fan brush afterwards and I'll, I'll play with it a little bit further, but that's good enough. And again, if I need something later on, I can always build it up. And while we're focusing here, it looks like this has to be done in absolute, like pristine detail. But the truth is, if you compare this, if you look at this relative to the whole painting, no one's gonna notice this as long as these edges look sharp and explain the outer boundaries of the white. And this edge looks like a gradient as it rolls into the shadow. As long as it does those two things, nobody will even notice it's in the painting, right? We tend to, when we look at paintings, we're, we're looking for inconsistencies and problems and things that don't make sense. We don't do it on purpose. It's just the nature of how we work. And so as long as there are no inconsistencies here, something that jumps out and is like, what is that? It doesn't matter that it is, um, that it's not a pristine pass. I'm, it's clean, don't get me wrong. Again, like all of these things, I have to make sure that I stress. When I say that I am, this is within a margin of error, my margins of error are so paper thin. When I say something's okay the way it is, that means it is about as perfect as it's gonna get without me spending 20 minutes under a microscope trying to perfect a color, a value, or an edge. This gradient does the job. It makes, it, it dissolves this bold white into what's underneath. That's all it's supposed to do. And in the grand scheme of the painting, this one inch area arguably is irrelevant. Nobody will notice it unless I do something there that's, that's, that's ugly and draws attention and doesn't make sense within the whole of the painting.
right? And the, the, the beauty of Impressionist work is that it applies that idea broadly across a piece of art. Like, you can say a few things with, with relatively great care and the rest of it in much broader terms. And the things that are broader terms, as long as they don't conflict with what we expect to see, meaning that you, you put a, you know, a red dot in the middle of a black shadow, kind of jumps out and looks out of place. As long as you don't do something like that, the, the areas that don't have all the details in them, that aren't so specific, that are more loose and interpretive, hold up just fine. You do need to have some places that are, that are more specific, um, but you don't need a lot of them. And the better you are at producing impressionist work, Sargent's a great example of that, the better you are, the less you need. Um, if you're just starting to play around with impressionist work, um, you're going to need more specifics, more tightly rendered areas to make the impression, uh, the, the areas that are built on impression, more believable. Nicholas took your advice yesterday. Which advice was that? He used Pantene conditioner on his brushes and they smell very nice. <laughs> okay, I'm glad <laughs> they smell nice. How are your uh, pigtails? He trimmed off the, the pigtails too. Okay. Now his brush hair is doing better than his own. <laughs> I don't have any advice for that. Again, I just want to make sure all of my all of my edges that are supposed to be sharp are, are sharp. I may it's kind of creeping out. Again, I want to make sure these things that are gold stay gold. There's not a lot of shadow in here, so I don't want my white creeping into the gold areas if I can help it. The darker stuff, like the purple, can kind of go over. It's not a big deal because I'm going to build white on top. But the white is going to be lighter than the gold. So if I put white in here, I can't, this no longer will be as a shadow if I leave gaps um, between my, when I put my details in on top. So I want to make sure those edges are clean. <clears throat> Again, just I'm going to take care of my just my graded edge first to make sure it's soft. Just take the paint down, just soften it a little bit, take out whatever brush strokes might have crept in along the way. Again, you know, it's kind of cutting back down to what's underneath, and so you can see through it. I want to make sure that, that it doesn't feel painted, that it feels like, it feels very natural. It doesn't feel like it was applied with a brush. I don't want people looking at my paintings. So for me, the reason that I take out the marks <clears throat> is that <clears throat> I, I want people, when they look at my work, to look at the painting and go, that's a great looking person. Wow, that person looks great. That person looks so real. That, per that person. Not that painting of the person looks nice, right? So the idea is that, and this is like if you're shooting to, to create the impression of something real, the way that you know that you've succeeded is the language that the viewer uses. If they say the painting looks or the painting is, you haven't hit the mark. If they say the person looks so real, they're seeing a person first, a painting second. If they say the painting looks, they're seeing the painting first and then perceiving that you have painted a person. If you are shooting for realism, what you want to hear is that the subject is what they see. They see the person. That's how you know that you've got realism down. And you don't tell people, you'll hear it in the language they use. Now, regardless of whether they say, you know, like, that looks like a photograph. 
like your painting should be better than the photograph. It should feel more three-dimensional. There should be a lot more to it. And as you can see, as I'm doing this, I'm making the photograph is a point of departure for me. It's nothing else. I'm not locked into, I don't want to copy it. I want to use it as a point of reference, but nothing more. Because I can do better than the photograph, than the camera. Um, <clears throat> and so, again, which, like for me, I'm taking out the brush strokes in large part because I'm trying to take the idea that it's a painting away, leaving the viewer with the impression that they're standing there, like their visceral response, even though they know what their brain perceives it as a person first and then can recognize that it's clearly not a person, it's a painting, but that all the data that their brain is taking in visually tells them it's a person. And then that has to be lined up with the idea they know that it's not real, that it's a painting. But it's the words that come out of the mouth that will tell you whether you've got realism down, right? Um, and it could be anything, you're not a person. If you paint, if you paint um, a piece of garlic well, the person viewing it will be able to smell the garlic. They will recognize it's a painting, but that's second to the to all the things that bring they are seeing, right? And so it's a, it's a to me it's an important distinction. And so taking out the tool, the brush, is important um, because it it's what takes a person from seeing this as a person or from seeing it as a painting of a person as to seeing it as a person who is painted. Very, very important distinction for me. So I'm just softening edges on this camera. The cast shadow is off the, um, the bottom of this tuxedo jacket. I just don't want it to be so sharp. knocking each one of these things down as I go. I'm not going to go and I get all the way in, I get all the way in, and then go back and knock it down. I'm going to do it all at the time that I'm in that area working so that I don't have a lot of repair work to do all over the apron after everything is in. I'd rather be able to do whatever repair work, whatever fixes are needed in this area. It's the only thing here. I don't want to have to like dangle my arm over wet paint. I don't want to worry about dragging this into something else. Easier for me to just knock this out while I'm here and get it out of the way. And again, as I'm doing it, I'm starting to lift some paint on purpose. I'm leveling it out and kind of, and the paint is coming up a little bit, leaving little imperfections. So this starts to have some of this showing through, which will help to marry it to the gold in here, but not enough that it reads like gold. It's creating variations within the shape to explain the natural um, way that we see things. Well, again, if you close your eyes, it's not pitch black. You see all kinds of movement, and that's blood. When you look at real things, they do the same thing. So if I paint this with that impression of that uneven, like, modeled effect, it fits more naturally into how you view things, how you actually see. And so by doing this, I'm imparting more reality, more of what your brain expects to see in the actual painting. And that helps to give a greater impression of it being exactly what I want it to be, a person in with an apron. And here, just gonna soften this edge. And again, I know that, I know that I've got, um, you know, I'm actually gonna, I'm actually gonna lift quite a bit of this. There's not a lot of light, like this is well lit, but this isn't. And this is just too bright. So I'm actually going to take some of that out. Uh, I'm gonna do it with a rag. I'm just gonna dab it until, it, until I have enough paint out of there that it doesn't read as being this light. 
And I don't mind leaving it coarse. That's a little bit better. That's a little bit more like it. But it's really kind of, this is just barely catching light in here, where this is pretty well lit. This is, this is very well lit and this isn't. So I don't want these to look like they're equally lit because in here there's a lot of shadow. This is way over the top if it was this light. From Nicholas. I tried a little fan brushing just to see on the grayscale paintings. Yes. I was accidentally mixing in some shadows into the lights. I'm just going to wait for block three. Yes, Nicholas, you do not have fan brushes in the videos. That means you don't use the fan brushes. What you are seeing here is not to get in the way of what you're doing in the program. Fan brushes, I have people hear me say this all the time. This is the most dangerous tool in art. It ruins more paintings than just about anything else. Stay away from a fan brush until you're shown how to use it. And no place in the program, no place in the entire eight blocks will you see this technique. What you're watching me do with this fan brush is based on 30 years of figuring out the mistakes. Do not use a fan brush. This is not meant to be an educational video. I've been saying that from the beginning. This is theater. You cannot do what I do from watching, and obviously, you just made my point. You played around with the fan brush and made a mess of your work. And that's only grayscale. No fan brushes. That's for everybody. Whether you're in my program or not, stay away from fan brushes until you really, really know what you're doing. Daniel's nodding his head yes. Until you really know what you're doing, stay away from fan brushes. They do more damage than just about anything else. Stay away from them. Learn how to do the work with a regular brush, a filbert or a flatter. Fan brushes are, are dangerous to the quality of your work. And they're addictive. They look like they do everything. And the bottom line is they, they ruin pretty much everything they touch unless you understand how much constraint you have to have in their use. Stay away from them. That's, that's some of the best advice I could give to any artist. <laughs> Stay away from fan brushes. They really are terrible. You have, to, you have to really know what you're doing to be able to control, not control the brush, but control the impulse to overuse it. Because they are, they're addictive. Every stroke is like, oh, that looks great. One more would be even nicer. And then you put the one more and you're like, oh, that looks great. One more would be nicer. And then you do the next stroke and it's ruined. And you can't back out of it. Now you have to actually paint the thing over. And that's exactly how it works. Like a stroke looks nice but it tells you to have more because another stroke would be that much nicer. And yeah, you're right, and you do the stroke and it's like, oh, there it is. But one more would just push it right over, right, right over the edge of you, exactly. And then that next stroke, and it's always that one that, you, that you're like, this will be the last stroke that ruins the work, always. And it doesn't matter if you say it'll be three strokes and so you do two, two will be the one that ruins the thing. It's just how it goes. Is the only thing that's going to protect you from that. And experience isn't a hundred hours of painting. It's a, a thousand hours, 1500 hours of painting is where you start to get experience. Bearing in mind, I'm saying 1500 hours, blocks one through four in the Evolve program are about 350 hours, which means you would have to do, you would have to do just maybe four to five versions of blocks one through four. I would tell you it was okay to pick up a fan brush at all if you were here in the school. Sana said, in quotes, you don't have the experience to have an opinion, Kevin yes. Murphy. Yeah. She said she needs to get this on her coffee cup. <laughs> some people like that and some people don't. Some people find <laughs> me terribly offensive when I say that. I can see it on their faces. Like, who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> Okay, so I've got that light in. I'm now gonna block in the purples in here. 
I match the color from yesterday. Now, because some of this is dry, it may not match perfectly, but I know that the color I mixed matches the color from yesterday. So I'm not, I don't have to worry about that. And again, even when I'm doing this, I, even though I know this is safe uh, because it's sealed, I always take my painting, my photographs off very carefully. The last thing I want to do is strip away paint. Um, I mean, it could do real damage to the painting. It's not that the painting would be ruined, but the amount of work to fix something like that, you, you don't want to find yourself there if you don't have to be. I'm just going to start by defining the, the bottom edge of the gold band and then I'll start cutting in all these shapes and then I'll fill. So again, I mean, it's basically just more of what we did yesterday. You know, you're going to see the, um, it's very much of a color by number, but you're going to get to see the painting a little bit at a time as these things get filled and I start cordoning off the gold. And, and, and now you start to see the purple in its place, the white in its place, the gold in its place. Even without the details, it's going to start to look, it's going to start to come together. And again, like a lot of the stuff, like in here, I don't even really want to paint the details because it looks so nice just the way it is. It's, it's the coloration and everything is working beautifully. Um, I don't have a choice. It has to be put in. Um, but it's, I'm now trying to figure out how I can put it in in a way that doesn't take away from what I'm seeing here. Can I get away with the gold being a slightly richer, warmer gold than a lighter, more yellow gold? Because the lighter, more yellow gold is going to is not going to play as beautifully in here as these richer kind of auburns um, that are currently in place. So I'm trying to figure out ways now of staying true to what's, what he's wearing while also being able to capitalize on a much more elegant look. Um, and so it's, it's a bit of a balancing act for me at this point. Figuring out what I can get away with, and I don't mean that in a sneaky way, but what I can get away with in the painting without surrendering to do, right? I could, I could just, I could just paint whatever I want, but then I'm not meeting the demands of the, of the client. And so I, that's not an option to me. To me, what the client wants is, is um, the most important thing. And so I want to make sure that what I am delivering meets the criteria that I've been given. And again, this painting, if it was a, a, gonna be alone on a wall in a room, maybe I'd have more artistic license, but this is gonna be in a collection with 50 other paintings in a grand, in a grand um, hall. So it can't deviate from the rest of the collection, not in, not in any meaningful way. And again, this is one of the, this is one of the challenges when you when you work professionally, is that you deal with you deal with um, not being able to necessarily paint what you think would be most beautiful, because what you think is most beautiful may not fit what the criteria of the job is, and putting your own opinions aside on that to be able to do the best job possible within the constraints of the uh, the, the project, and again. I, I could talk to the client about it if I really was adamant about this. I could talk to the client and see what he says. Um, but again, for me, I'd rather, I'd rather just work it out and do the right thing. I may be able to find a beautiful middle ground between them and where the photograph is that will give them 
the piece that fits beautifully in the collection and doesn't jump away from the rest of them, but also gives me the satisfaction of maintaining a portion of what I have here that I find so beautiful. And again, that's part of the challenge of making art, right? It's not just about the client, but about, uh, about the, it's about me creatively solving this problem so that everybody wins. I want to deliver the best possible painting, but at the same time, make sure that the client, I mean, if I make this stuff what I want it to be, and I bring it to the client, and they're like, no, 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 that, that's no good. It has to be this particular color, because that color of gold is, is the one that we have, and it's what we use, and it's been that color for 400 years. Well, the fact that I like it this way doesn't, doesn't matter at that point, right? I don't want to do the job twice. So I've got to find, I've got to find a creative solution to it to make sure that the painting doesn't come back for corrections. And, and I can tell you that over the years, all of the commissioned work I've done, um, not illustration, but all of the, the portraits that I've done, I have never had a painting come back for a change. Never, not once. Um, and I attribute that to the idea that um, first and foremost on my mind is delivering to the client what they have asked for, regardless of their opinion. Um, and so, again, because that's the job. If I, want, if I want to do something, if I want it this color, I'll do the painting for myself and I'll hang it on my wall. But as long as, as, long as I'm doing it for a client, it's going to be what they've, what, they've, what they've asked and what they're paying for. And a lot of artists struggle with that. Um, my contract actually says very clearly that the determining factor in when a painting is done and when it is done properly, right? So the client actually doesn't get to have an opinion about that. They're hiring me. They're hiring me based on the quality and the style of work that I produce, and they accept in my contract that I am the sole artistic determiner of what the painting should be in order to be best. And in that, they relinquish all control. Once we do the initial photo shoot, um, they approve the photo shoot, and then the scale of the piece, and at that point, they no longer have a say in what the painting looks like, as long as I deliver a painting that fits the size of everything else in my collection that they would have, that they would have used to decide to hire me. Like if I deviate drastically from the look of my, my normal work, then that's a problem. But as long as I'm delivering a painting that falls in line with what my normal work looks like, the stuff they would have seen that would have encouraged the commission, I get to do whatever I want with the painting. But again, that freedom, that freedom, like I take it, it I'm very careful about that because I don't want to deliver something that doesn't fit what someone's looking for. I mean, the whole idea is, you know, a lot of, and this is where you get into this kind of rub where people are like, art is a gift and it's a special thing and I'm selling a part of my soul when I, when I sell a painting. Well, if you think like that, then you start imparting your own opinions in a, it, and I would say arguably, as you get further and further in, in a heavy-handed manner. You can become a bully. Well, you don't know anything. You're a client. You just write the check and you let me make the art, right? You, and, but that's a terrible way to think. It's a terrible way to think, and who would want who would want to hire you, having no idea what you're gonna what you're gonna deliver to them, and if you deliver something that is much less than what they want, or a drastic deviation from what they want, are they going to show off the piece in a positive light? They may begrudgingly take it and pay for it because the contract demands it, but what are they going to tell their friends? What are they, like? You, so now, instead of your painting being a, um, a showcase piece and a marketing tool on someone's wall, you basically shut that door on everyone they know. And chances are, if somebody buys a portrait, are probably financially capable of doing the same. And when they see it, if it's been done well, there's a, there are a percentage of them who are going to be interested, right? And so. You want to make sure that your client is so happy with what you've done that they are showing it to everybody and saying what an incredible experience it's been to have you um, to have you come in and uh, and do the portrait. And there's a lot more to that. It's not just about the portrait; it's the relationship you build with the people when you're doing the photo shoot and 
and kind of having a conversation about this stuff. So, and I've got a few things that I do that are, they're specific to me, but they, they certainly help in the process. So I'll give you, I'll give you a, an example. Um, so I cook. So when I go out to a client, very often I'll stay with the client for a couple of days. And what I'll do is one of the days that I'm there, I'll actually cook dinner for them. Now, that seems crazy, but like I'm there to make a painting. But I'll come in and I wanna to get to know them a little bit. And so I'll actually cook a really nice meal. You know, a meal, dessert, right? Something very nice. And a part of it is that I enjoy cooking and I enjoy sharing that as well. It also gives me an opportunity to see everything hard down. And trust me when I tell you, they talk about it. I, I, don't, I don't serve bad food. And they talk about it. And I, I can tell you that one of my clients, many, many years back, I had done a, I had, I had painted four, I did four portraits for this family. And they encouraged me to go to an event where I, where I was able to put my work up. They actually brought their paintings for me. Um, rather than me shipping paintings from from um, New York all the way to California, they put the paintings up for me as on a display, um, and I was at this event, uh, basically offering portrait services. And um, a couple came over and was talking to me about a portrait. And during the portrait conversation, the the other the client that I had came over and started talking to them about this dessert that I had cooked. And now every time I go out to their place, every time I've come out to do another portrait how I've spent a few hours in the kitchen with them, making a wonderful meal, memorable meal. And, and so obviously if you don't cook, you can't do something like that. And if you don't stay with the client, you can't do something like that. But I, I have built that in for the people that are interested in it as part of the service that I offer. And I can tell you, they talk about the meals. They, they talk about the paintings too, but they talk about the meals. So I'm building a rapport with them. I'm building, I'm building bonds with them that have nothing to do with me as a client um, delivering a painting. And those bonds matter. They matter. Um, a, a, a number of my clients I consider, I mean, they're total strangers, but over the time they've become friends. And these are people my life would never have crossed paths with them if not for art. And my life is enriched through the relationships. Um, I have one person in mind, I got like, um, just in my own head, I don't, you know, I'm not giving out family names and anything, but um, one of them, whenever I, whenever I go out to that state, I stay with them. I spend a day or so with them, even though I'm not there for business. And a good portion of my um, business understanding comes from my conversations with this gentleman very successful. Um, he's hardworking, very much down to earth, but very successful. And um, he's helped to educate me in things of business that I, could, I couldn't possibly get going even to a business seminar. Because the guys teaching at the business seminar make in a year what he makes in a week, or maybe in a day. And so they don't have that perspective. That perspective is reserved for a very small number of people in the world. And so to be able to sit down and have a conversation and see how somebody who has eight, nine, ten figures as a net worth, they're able to give you a perspective that nobody who doesn't have that could. And so, and even like, even though I don't have that kind of money, the thinking has made me better at doing my the things on my end. Learning how to sell a better at selling portraits based on the information I got from time spent with this gentleman. And so, again, like one of the beautiful things about doing this kind of work is that you get to meet people. You get to meet people you would never meet otherwise. And, you know, again, like within your own circles, people tend to have similar stories. When you meet somebody who's on the other side of the country, or the other who's grown up in a completely different environment, different different social structures and, and different different financial categories, you're stepping into a world that doesn't the gravity pulls in a completely different direction than the one in the world you live in. And if you're open to, um, to learning, people are happy to share what they know. 
And, and like I said, I mean, I've got a wonderful relationship with this family. And, um, but every time I go out there, I learn something. And I mean, it's just, it's great. It's great. Um, I don't really know where that all started. But hopefully it all connects. It was connected to um, commissions and... Uh, delivering what, you, what you're supposed yeah. to deliver. And then, and again, like with the cooking, a little bit more than you're expected to deliver. You know, building a career in art, like with what I do, not with small pieces, though, like if you're doing, like I recommend always starting, like I always talk about like flea markets and things like that. But once you get into a place where you have returning clients and now it's about building relationships. And it's not that it's not about building relationships even at the flea market level. Um, and for those of you who have never heard me talking about how you sell at a flea market, I had a conversation with a couple of students the other day and showed them how working a flea market, like an established market, and basically basically eight hours a day, say Saturday and Sunday, that you could you could argue without too much effort pulling 80 grand a year. Um, so when I say flea market, some of you are probably like, what? 80 grand a year, easy math. And it's math, it's, it's, it's all obvious when you see it. Um, so I have a couple of people, Alicia, I think, if she's here today, she was there in the conversation. And it's like, it doesn't seem possible until it's laid out. And you're like, wait a second, it's so obvious, how could I not have seen that before? And it's just a matter of like, how you think about what you're doing. But even in that setting, the relationships that you build determine how far you go. Even in a flea market, if you're selling paintings, okay? If somebody comes in and they commission a piece of art and they come back two weeks later and get it, you've not really built a relationship. But if you take the commission on one day, the following week, you're at the same place painting it. And the following week you deliver it. When the person buys it, up, when they come in up front, you can tell them, hey, I'm actually gonna be working on your daughter's portrait next week, probably around noon. It'll be on my schedule at noon, or it'll be two o'clock, or it'll be four o'clock. Feel free to come by if you wanna watch. Tell your friends. Now, that person is of course telling people they know about you. Not for the sake of them coming to buy, but for the sake of them seeing, their friends seeing their daughter being painted. They want to show it off. But you, as, a, as the artist, now have another four or five or eight or 10, 12 people coming by that never have come there. They're coming there specifically to see you paint this one kid. And if you have four paintings that you do over the day, and each one of the people that you built that rapport with them, each one of them is sending you potential clients. And if you're doing a good job painting those paintings, each one of those people stand there. Let's say there's eight people show up that know the kid you're painting. And they see the painting and they know you're doing a great job because they recognize the kid. It's beautiful. How many of those do you think are gonna buy? And you do that with each painting over the day, the four paintings. You potentially lock down your four commissions just out of that network you created by extending the invitation to come and watch you work next week. And if you roll that over week over week over week, you can get so busy that there's no limit to what you can charge for it. Because again, it's supply and demand. If you're only taking four paintings a day, two days a week, and somebody wants it bad enough, they'll pay whatever you ask. And that's not, again, you have to understand you know, what the market will bear, but there's, that's all built on the interaction you have with the client. You can take their money and deliver the painting or you can engage them in a conversation and tell them you'll be here next week working on it. Tell your friends. If you'd love to see the painting being done, see, who doesn't like to watch an artist work? So, but it's little things like that. You build your own client base and you get their information, right? Again, I'm talking about like Mother's Day. How many, how many men are out there running around on the Saturday before Mother's Day looking for something so they don't get in trouble again? For not having a proper gift on Mother's Day. This is a perfect gift. Once you have somebody who's bought and they're happy, 10 months later you reach out to them. Mother's Day is right around the corner. Have you got anything yet? Because I know the answer is no. And I know in another seven weeks 
You'll be still be looking. How about commissioning another portrait? Your children are now a year older. I know that they're different. They're, they're older, they're more mature, they're whatever these things are, whatever their age group, right? Because anyone who has kids knows every 12 months, it's a completely different child. And so there's an easy gift, right? But you're not even trying. You're just sending out an email to the 70 or 80 or 100 people whose kids you've painted over the year. Now, that, and you're still bringing in customers cold, um, you know, basically cold um, traffic and selling, plus you're reaching into your database of people who've already bought and are happy. It's not too hard to build, to build a career that way. And, that's, and again, that's just the beginning. And you're rolling it over one after another, and you know you are consistently generating income, and you have business, you can expand. You'll have an entire week where you're not working that you can do your own stuff for galleries and for whatever else. But again, it's not about it's not about like learning a technique and all of a sudden being a pro making 100 grand a year. Build it. But it's not hard to build. If you think you're gonna step out into a world throwing five and eight and ten thousand dollar paintings out there and people are gonna be snatching them up, you're confused. That's not how it works. But it also doesn't take 20 years. The way I laid it out for the, for the people that were in that group that I was talking to the other day, it was two years to go from, to go from um, 40,000 a year to 80,000 a year. But if $80,000 easy, that's, that's, you'd have to be incompetent to not be able to drum that business up. Right, so like having, a, having an idea about how to build your career having a sound plan, knowing where, um, knowing, knowing where the, the points are where you're going to be able to um, build a network for yourself that's gonna do some of the work for you, right? You can't track down every potential client, but if your clients love what you do, they are gonna spread the word for you. If they are your friends or your allies, and I don't mean that they were friends before, but if you can build friendships with these people, even if they're business relationships to, in, in your mind or their mind, it's fine. If, they're, if they are an ally of yours in the way that they are sharing your work with people they know who might be interested, doesn't matter how you define the relationship, they are working for you in places you can't get on your own. And so, Cultivating those relationships, they're not hard to cultivate. They do take some work sometimes, but they're not hard to cultivate. But you have to know that you have to cultivate them. Otherwise, they come and they go. People walk into your life, they walk out of your life, and that person that you just let kind of stroll away might have been the linchpin to building your career because they know all the people you need to know to get what you're looking for in, in a client's help. And it takes time. You'll make mistakes. Um, you'll make mistakes. I, I, um, I love to tell the story. So I... Um, you gonna go there? What? You gonna go there? I am gonna go there. I'm gonna share, I'm gonna oh, share a really kind of funny and painful story. So... Um, one of my favorites. Yeah, one of your favorites. So I had a... Um, I had done a portrait. It was a wedding portrait. And I um, went to the wedding uh, to do the unveiling of the painting. And so um, I'm there, I'm having a great time. And so, something that's very unlikely, uh, unlike me, I had a couple of drinks. I don't, I don't generally drink. Um, and so I, I wasn't drunk, but I had a couple of drinks. And over, you know, maybe an hour or two. And so um, at some point during this, during the... Um, the, the party afterwards, a young lady comes over to me and starts talking to me about this portrait, how much she loves the portrait, and she and her husband want, Daniel has got this grin on his face, how she and her husband want to have a portrait done, and um, and she's, she's really quite beautiful. I'm, I'm estimating her, because again, I, like I do it just naturally, I'm kind of sizing up, like without thinking about it, I kind of estimate her probably to be around 35, 37 years old, She's tall and she's thin and she's beautifully dressed. She's clearly affluent. Um, 
I'm so I'm looking at all this and I'm kind of measuring the situation. And in the conversation, she then says, um, oh, and that's my husband over there. She points to this table and at the table, there are three bitty little white haired ladies. Okay. And I mean, they're like either three of them, you know, stacked on top of each other are five feet tall. The tiny little things and all white hair and you know, they're just, they're, they're, they're elderly. And, um, and sitting in between the three of them is this man who doesn't look much taller than them, white hair, white beard. And most expensive words out of my mouth. I said, when she said, and that's my husband over there. I said, the old guy? <laughs> I looked back at her. I already knew the portrait was gone. <laughs> in that moment, I realized she was not in her thirties. He was not as old as he looked. He was just surrounded. The context made him look older. He looked like he fit in with them, but he was actually probably in his early sixties and she was in her fifties. She was just very well taken care of. Um, but the portrait, it was gone on three words, the three most expensive words of my life. The old guy, and that's, we're not going to count the question mark is that's, that's a gift, but the old guy cost me, cost me a lot of money <laughs> because that would have been a really nice portrait. The two of them, that would have been a very, very nice paycheck. And, um, gone like that. It happens. It happens. And so, um, yeah, that was brutal. That was brutal. I, wanted, I couldn't believe that I did that. I don't know. Even if I, even if I hadn't had a drink, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe it was just, I, I wasn't, I wasn't thinking fast enough, but maybe if I hadn't been drinking, I wouldn't have made that mistake, but I know me and I think I probably would have anyway. I was just, it just, it, it didn't line up. It didn't line up the visuals. And so, um, yeah, the old guy, that was like over $10,000 a word, gone. Well, then you factor in all the people that she would have told. Them. Yeah. And then uh, I'm talking about networking. They were very, they were very well established in a, in a very <laughs> affluent community. They loved what I had done. If I had done something comparable for them, who would have seen the portrait? How many jobs would have come out of that? Yeah, it was, it was, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to find a low hanging pipe from which to hang myself. It was, <laughs> it was bad. And again, you're going to make mistakes, but you have to be okay with it. You make the mistake and you're like, eh, well, I guess we'll close that door. And I, even though I knew the job was gone, I still tried to fix the conversation. I kind of cleaned it up. I was apologetic. Um, but I, I wasn't doing it to save the job. I knew the job was gone already. I was doing it because I felt bad. Um, that was really dumb. But again, like even me, for all that I've done and all that I know and all the business acumen and the old guy. So, but um, yeah, but anyway, so you're gonna trip and you're gonna fall sometimes. It's okay. The best of us do. But what do you do with it? You get up, you learn from it. Now, if I'm in a situation, I keep my mouth shut. I let the client talk as much as possible. I say as little as possible, I've got a signed contract. <laughs> That's actually not true, but, but I'm, I am very thoughtful. Like I, when I meet somebody new, um, I am very measured in the language that I use because, um, because I've had, a, I've had a bad experience and that kind of stuff, it sticks with you. It does, doesn't shatter your confidence if you don't let it, but it's a, it's an, it's an education in it, right? And so again, I'm very, I'm very measured in the language that I use, uh, especially up front. Once I've got somebody and I'm talking to them and I've got a feel for them, then it's different. I kind of loosen up a bit, but I'm, I'm very careful at the beginning. So, you know, Kevin, whenever I make a mistake, I just remember that story and tell myself I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, but the thing is, but that's good. Again, you know, like, Look, the whole point of me showing people that I struggle when I do this sometimes is that it brings me, it brings me down to like, it takes me off any pedestal you might have. And it's so that when you're struggling, you can go, well, you know, Kevin struggles too. And like, I think of him as being so good or what, like whatever the status is that you perceive me at, I fight the same fight as you do. And so when you hit those hard times, 
you can be comfortable in the fact that you're not alone. And it's not just other people at your level, but it's even the pros, even the big names. Like, and so me falling on my face in that thing and sharing it reminds you that when you are in business and you're doing something and you, and you fall on your face, it's, it's, that's not the end of it. And don't let it shatter you. Take it as an educational moment and then figure out how to not do it again and move on, right? Again, I, I'm pretty good on the business end of things, but um, I was bad. Like, I, when I was saying the words, I could almost see the words and I was trying to grab them before they reached her. I mean, it was, <laughs> it was bad. I could see the words coming out of my mouth. I was like, no! <laughs> the speed of sound, much faster than the speed of my hands trying to reach out and kind of grab the words. I hope everybody got a good laugh out of that. Yeah, lots of LOLs in the comments. Yeah, yeah, it was bad. <laughs> it was many years ago. Many years ago, but very funny. Now that I look back at it, I love sharing. I love sharing stories like that because they do, they really kind of bring, they bring, they bring this whole back down to earth. It's so easy. It's so easy to elevate somebody or something. When the truth is we're all fighting. We're all living the same kind of life. We're all facing, you know, we're all facing challenges. You know, again, not everyone's challenges are the same. Um, you know, we're, we're all different than that. But the thing is that the idea that so many people, they think that the challenges are theirs and theirs alone. Everyone else has kind of figured it out and just coasting along. It's, it's usually not the case. Yeah, there are some people who have got it figured out. Um, but most people don't. Most people have no idea what they're doing. They're fumbling through life. Um, you know, it's, I, I, somebody asked me, like, so I have, I have around a lot and, and most of my joking, I, I have this kind of really arrogant attitude, but the truth is I'm, I'm, I'm really quite humble about this because I get up every day like everybody else. And I don't think of myself as being extra special. I, I get a lot of back and forth with people over the word talent. And like for me, I don't believe that I have any talent as the word is used. I have clawed my way to where I am. I mean, literally clawed my way here. And um, because of that, I'm not confused about, um, about who I am. I don't feel like I was birthed by the gods and I landed on a cloud and I'm on high looking down at the masses as I throw them crumbs of education. Like, I don't think like that. <laughs> I get up every day like everyone else. My back hurts every morning. It's like my back, my lower back is like my alarm clock. I wake up every morning to pain. I get up, I crawl out of bed. It takes me 15 minutes to be able to stand upright. Like I, I come in here, my, I can't see anymore. My hand, I get cramps in my hand when I work sometimes. I'm, I'm like everybody else. It's very easy to stay humble when you kind of, your hand is cramping up and you, you, you know, you do things like, you guy, you know, it's very easy to stay humble when you, when that's who you are. And um, I never lose sight of it. I never lose sight of it, like where I come from. I would never go back if I didn't have to, but I grew up, I grew up in a place very different from where I live. The skills I have, I, they weren't given to me. I have fought for these. The Evolve program, like the education that I offer, is my way of making it so other people don't have to claw their way to the skills. You know, this, was, this has been a brutal, brutal climb for me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm past that now. But the idea that I'm in a position to be able to make it so that other people don't have to suffer to get to this place, that I can, I can hand it to them in a way that takes the fight away, that they can just kind of come in and comfortably learn. To me, that's such an important thing. But I never lose sight of where I came from. And, and I'm not to a place where everything is great. I'm still a person. I wake up every day and it's like every day I'm losing more gray hair. I can't get a haircut right now. Those of you who are in the program know, my head shaved most of the time. I'm gonna have like, I'm gonna look like Bob Ross by the time, <laughs> by the time this painting is done. And, um, and I, I'm worried about that. But I'm like everybody else. All I have is a head start. It's all I've got. I'm like everybody else. I've just got a head start. 
So easy to be humble when you when you know who you are. And I think it's important that that I never allow people to see me as anything other than that. I think that's so important. Um, one for their also for mine because it's so easy it's so easy to buy into the hype when other people keep telling you you're extra special it's so easy to forget that you're just like everybody else you may work harder than some people but there are gonna be some people that work harder than you you might be smarter than some people but they're gonna be people who are smarter than you as a painter I'm not extraordinary I'm better than proficient but I'm not extraordinary there are extraordinary painters out there people who I'm barely qualified to clean their brushes now that's my assessment but like there are some people out there, and I'm like, no, I'm not giving names, but there are some people out there who I am barely qualified to, to clean their brushes. And I know it about it. If I allowed hype around what I do and what I've done um, to think about myself, I would not believe that to be the case. And I would be, I would be delusional in that, in that assessment. So again, I try to keep my feet on the ground. And, I, and you can see it in what I do here. I make sure that you, or to the degree that I can, that you perceive me that way because I think it's important. Uh, Rebecca said, I almost feel it's rude to ask, but I'm going to ask anyways. What is the most that you know of someone earning for a portrait? You or another person? Oh. Like $1 million? Is that too low? <sighs> okay, so there's there was a portrait painter, um, Nelson Shanks. He was the arguably the preeminent portrait painter in the world. He, according, according to everything that I understand, was charging $300,000 per figure. He's not the highest paid person to make portraits. I know that there was a Japanese artist, and he's not alone, I don't remember the guy's name. He doesn't do portraits per se, but if you want a portrait from him, there's six hundred thousand per figure. He's not a portrait painter, but he paints realism. And so if you want to commission a portrait, it's not what he does, but he'll do it for you for 600,000. It's possible that there's, I imagine that if you commissioned Ard Nerdrum for a portrait, you would be paying way, way up there, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars for a portrait because he doesn't do portraits. He paints figures. If you want a portrait, that's a special thing. So, um, Again, this is, we, we live in a world that, that we've got capitalism. Um, whatever somebody's willing to pay is what the highest price is. And so again, you talk about like Nelson. If he does a family of three people, he's at 900 grand. If that Japanese artist does a painting of three people, he's at one, what is he, what, six, 1.8 million. So, you know, that's of course not the average. The average, the average highly skilled. So I'll kind of give you an idea of what the portrait market looks like. If you're dealing with portrait brokers, which you could argue, arguably say, excuse me, kind of standardizes the business. Wrong. It's going to be about $8,000 a portrait. And those are kind of the entry level painters. They're good. Um, they're producing, they're producing skilled professional level work. Their work is consistent, not extraordinary, but it's consistently excellent. Once you get past that, they're about $8,000. You're probably going up to $12,000, where you've got guys who've got a, basically the same skill level, but they are, um, and we're talking about a three-quarter figure like this. And then, so 12,000, 15,000, probably about the same skill level, maybe a little bit better, but not markedly, but much more experience. So they've got a broader body of work. They may have a celebrity or portfolio, or a politician, or and so their portfolio stands out, not because it's better, but because the subject matter is more recognizable in some cases, right? So if you look at two portfolios, and one guy is painting just people, and another person has Brad Pitt in his portfolio, and has a governor and two well-known mayors, well, the one with Brad Pitt and the governor and the two mayors, even if the work is equal, can, can, can justify the higher price than the, the group down below, right? Again, not extraordinary, but markedly better. You can see, if you put them next to each other, not even next to each other, you can tell. The, the skin tones feel more like skin. There's just, just the, the artists are better skilled. Talking like 20 grand. 
The next bump up is where the, where the big guys start coming in. At about 30 grand, again, for something this size, right, 25, maybe around 25. Yeah, it's about 25,000. You're gonna to start to see heavy hitters. Um, and these are guys who really know what they're doing. They are, um, they are arguably master of what they do. They, they know how to manipulate paint. They know how to, how to create form and, and they're, they're, just, they're just highly skilled. Highly skilled and they've got a body of work. Follow the road of building a portfolio of paintings, just making paintings. It's different than somebody who builds a career with the goal of creating a celebrity status around themselves within the industry. The person who goes after the celebrity status may be a little bit slower coming out of the gate because they're selecting the work that they're doing. They may be doing pro bono pieces to, to kind of grab recognizable people. There's, there's things that they'll do to lay a groundwork that'll give them a greater trajectory later in life. Um, Again, just because somebody charges, another thing is just because somebody charges 85,000 for a portrait doesn't mean they're working. You charge $85,000 for a portrait and you're only doing three portraits a year. Yeah, you're making a good living, but you're only working on three jobs a year. Somebody who's doing a $20,000 portrait might do 20 jobs a year or 12 jobs a year or whatever it is that they can manage. I think the average portrait painter only does about 12 pieces a year if they're dealing with a portrait broker, um, but that's not bad. Right, if you're at twenty thousand dollars a portrait, you're doing twelve is two hundred and forty thousand. You're kicking back a percent, maybe. Might be as much as fifty percent. I, I don't remember, but but even if it's fifty percent, so you're working during the year, you're doing what you love. Chances are you're not clocking forty hour work weeks. You're probably clocking twenty hour work weeks, right? Spread out over a month. If you do one a month, that's eighty hours in a, in a month. Right? This painting, even with all the insane stuff in it, is going to be under sixty hours with all of my talking. Right, so this is about a 30 hour painting. So if you can do one of these in a month, and you do every month and you're splitting a $20,000 price point with the broker, 50-50, you're still making 120 grand a year. Not bad for 20 hour work weeks or even 15 hour work weeks. Or maybe you work two weeks and you have the other two weeks off each month. Right, so um, it's, it's a good business. Start there, you start down at the bottom. And in fact, you don't even start with the broker. You've got to develop some skills before you even can get in the door there. Develop the skills, build the portfolio, then get in. Then you've got to hope that they build you and let you kind of elevate yourself within their ranks. Because of course there's politics there too, you know? But again, it, it all, it's all how you network, how you socialize, how you do those things, it all contributes. You have to have the quality of work, but once that's in place, then it's like, how do you approach the market? Build a celebrity status, it takes longer to get where you're going, but the potential of getting so much more for your work is there. And then we have a few celebrities out there that are in the, you know, that are in like the portrait industry. Um, and again, it's, they're celebrities within our industry. And so like when they go out into the world, like, like so again, if you painted a president, chances are all the people that would love to be president or who like that president, or, Take notice of you. You painted a president. The president can have anyone they want do the portrait. They picked you, you must be special. I don't know anything about portraits, but the president picked you. And when I have a painting done, I want to say, this artist who painted me has a painting in the White House. There's your celebrity status and how it works. So, uh, and again, so now that person is gonna get deluged with work because of it. And they're gonna be able to adjust their prices accordingly. But you have to build that intentionally. That doesn't happen accidentally. You have to have an intent to build a celebrity status within that industry in order to be able to do that. And that requires real networking skills. Question mm -hmm. from Marcella. What will be a fair price to charge if you are not well known, but you do a good job? Well, first of all, I would say that um, we are, generally speaking, we are not good judges of whether or not we do a good job, right? And so time is what tells us whether or not we're doing a good job. I do a painting and I'm like, woohoo, I'm special. I like what I did. It's really nice. My mother likes it too, right? I put it out into the world and nobody wants it. Clearly it's not as nice as me and my mother thought it was. 
I do a painting and I like it and I put it out in the world. My mother likes it too. And somebody buys it. Clearly it's not just mine and my mother's opinion. I do that a few times and everything I do sells. I know that I've got something. I know I'm doing something right. I can, I can now defend a price. If I'm doing paintings and I like them and all the people around me like them, but nobody's writing a check, it doesn't have any value, not, not monetary value. So, um, and I'm sorry, I got off on a tangent. What was the actual question? I want to make sure I answer it. <clears throat> what would be a fair price to charge for a portrait if you, not well known, but you do good work? Yeah, so what I would say is like, it's a very hard thing to set a price for yourself, to just jump in and go, I think this painting is worth it. Because if you overshoot what, it's, what somebody's willing to pay, you don't make anything. And then it's kind of embarrassing backpedaling from a price, especially if the price isn't that high. Let's say you do a, you do, you're, you're looking at it and you say, I'll do a painting like this for three grand, okay? Because I'm trying to get into the market. Three thousand dollars it'll take me two weeks to do. I don't mind making three grand for two weeks. But you put it out into the world, and at three thousand dollars, you can't get any buyers. Now you're going to backpedal to twenty five hundred. Like it, like if you're willing to backpedal to twenty hundred, and someone sees that, they could probably negotiate you down to two thousand. And at that point, maybe 1800 Now you're just kind of giving stuff away. You need to know that when you set that price, it's the price that people are going to pay. And so you're only going to know based on your market, right? So here where I am, there's, there's, there are people who, can, who have expendable cash who could write checks. Now, we're not talking about billionaires. We're talking about people who have good paying jobs and they have expendable cash. There's a limit to what these people would and could spend. Now, if you go to a place like Beverly Hills, there's a very different demographic there. If you are there and you have access to clients there, there's almost no price you could ask that would be outside of their range. Then it's a matter of do they want what you're offering. So I can't give you a number. Again, depending on where you are, that's going to determine access to as potential buyers is going to determine what the price is that you can offer. Again, you can live, you can live where I grew up in the Bronx, where nobody could write even, you know, a $200 check for a painting. But maybe that's not where you're selling it. You've got access to a place out in California or down in Texas where there is money and an interest. So you're dealing with what that demographic can offer you. But again, like, look at the market. Um, see if you can find artists that produce at your level and then see what they're charging. Assume that they are where they are because they've established the price. That it's not like they just decided that was an, it was an arbitrary number and that's what they're making. But that they probably started lower and they worked their way to that. Uh, but again, assessing for yourself the quality, of being able to say, my work is pretty good. Good is like I don't know what. I have to see what you do, um, but like. In the program, when we talk about this kind of stuff, like in Evolve, I talk to people about how do you price your work? And this is a great thing for everybody. Don't think that your work has a value beyond the labor you put into it as a starting point, right? Um, somebody jumped in the other day, elevates <clears throat> it from being just um, labor to something greater than that, right? It's more than just a craft. And so, <clears throat> You want to start by figuring out what your time is worth, right? So if you work a job and you make 20 bucks an hour, you've already determined what you're willing to sell away the hours of your life for. So if you do a portrait and it takes you 10 hours and you have already determined based on the job you have that you are comfortable selling away the hours of your life at 20 bucks an hour, you should not be asking for more than 20 for that painting. So 10 hours, it's 200 bucks. 100 hours is $2,000. And you can do it that way, and that's gonna create a consistency across your paintings while you begin to establish yourself as an artist. Smaller pieces will take less time, they'll be less expensive. Bigger pieces will take be more expensive. People will be able to expand and contract based on their own budgets. But you'll be able to establish yourself one at this, this baseline of what you already find acceptable as a paycheck. It's not an arbitrary number. Then, as you start to build a client base and you see that number is good, 
you're getting a lot of work, give yourself a raise. Go from 20 to $30 an hour. That's a massive raise. It's a 50% raise. But a $200 painting becomes a $300 painting. That's not drastic overall. A $2,000 painting becomes a $3,000 painting. Again, somebody who dropped two grand on a painting, $3,000 is probably not gonna deter them if you've got a body of work to show them what they're gonna get. So you give yourself that 50% raise and you see what the market will bear. Are you still getting as much work? Because if you are, another $5 an hour raise six months down the road. So you go from 20 to 30 to 35, market stays the same, up it to 40. It's not arbitrary, but you're slowly nudging the number up. An 11 by 14 head and shoulders portrait goes from 100 to 200. Again, people can spend 100, they can probably spend 200 if they want it. You may get a drop off in the number of people buying, but the raise in price, you could lose half your clients and still make the same money working half the amount of time. So that's actually a pretty good trade. You're getting back your time, which is your most valued commodity, making the same money, right? Where maybe $15, you would stay with the same number of clients, you're working the same number of hours, so you're making an extra 50%. And again, this is all economics. You, you play with the numbers and you figure out what works. But you don't want to overshoot and go $50 an hour and find that there's nobody there, and then go $40. How's that? Mm, still nobody here. $35. Just so you know, Kevin, we've been having some network oh. connections. So it's been going in and out about the portrait. Rebecca said, if he doesn't talk, I think he would be sick. <laughs> he talks to himself when he paints. <laughs> yes, I actually do. I kind of mumble to myself nonstop. Possible requests that were quite odd, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I've had a, few, had a few interesting requests over the years for paintings. Uh, one, one in particular, I'm sure, is the one that you talk about the mermaid, right? Oh. Oh, is that not what you're thinking? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> I was thinking of the one where you had to move the painting two, two inches over. Like you could just lift them up and move them instead of having to completely repaint them two inches to the left. Right, you run into stuff like that. Um, anyway, so I'm just going to be painting. I know we're bouncing in and out. Well, we're not going to have this problem tomorrow. We're going to have a hot spot in here. Hopefully we'll have a nice clean engine at the hallway through. If you have questions, you can pose them, but I'm gonna stay away from lengthy stories, I think, today. We're live again. Rachel said, bummer, lengthy stories from Kevin are the best. Hey everybody, heading back in. So. 
Hopefully we'll be a little bit better with our internet service after the break. Again, no stories at this point until we see that, the, uh, that our service is solid. I'll stay away from stories. Brandon says hello. Hey, how's it going? Hillary Ward is here. Thank you for making it back in. So again, at this point, I'm just trying to get, I'm just trying to get these areas filled. Um, leave the gold showing through where it's supposed to be. So I'm going to get the white down. I'll drop in the purple on this side, and then kind of cut across. Moody says hi. Hey, Mark. Welcome back. You know, this is a great, um, a great painting for a demo because you get, you're going to get to see how details are handled. At least. A couple of different ways the details might be handled um, in layers, and then also how more organic things like a face. I say detail, but they're really like mechanical details. And then something like a face, um, which is going to be handled not 
It's laid, it's handled in the same way as far as the layers. There's just a lot more to it in each layer, or at least in the second layer. Um, you know, a lot of the time when, when artists do demos like this, they're dealing in a much simpler, more controlled subject matter, right? So you'll have like a person in a cotton shirt. There's not a lot, there's not a lot of different things going on, different materials, metal and glass and wood and, you know, so you're only seeing them creating an impression of a couple of little things. Um, again, skin, one type of material probably, and maybe a very kind of a loose background that looks more like paint than, or a hint at something rather than having the texture of the thing. So this is really forcing my hand um, to, to do a really good job of explaining all these different materials. Like even in here, the sun here is embroidered. This in here is leather. This, like I don't even know what this is, like material-wise. I know what it looks like, but like, I know what it is, but I don't, like I couldn't, I don't know what it's called. Like you've got right here three different things and I've got metal, right? So just in here, Embroidery, leather, metal, and then whatever this is, whatever this thing is called. And so all these different things that have to be addressed, and each one of them reflects light differently, the colors are subtly different, and all of that has to be accounted for while I'm doing this. Ethan Clark is watching. Hey, Ethan, how are you? Ethan, Ethan is one of our old students here at the school, and he works with Evolve. Um, he helps us check homework for, uh, for our students. He said, great. And always as I'm doing is trying to make sense of my marks. Um, it's always a bit of a challenge. You know, when, again, normally I would have a lot less in the way of marks in here for myself. And so the more, the mark, the more marks I have, the more confused I'm getting. Just making sense of what my intent was. It's like, you know, when you do a transfer, you have to know why each mark goes down. Um, right, it's not about putting down every mark you see, but having a purpose between, before, uh, for the marks that do go down. That way, when the photograph is taken away, and you're only looking at the lines that you put through um, on your transfer, they make sense.
Megan, you can see, I, mean, I, I keep kind of stressing this point. Like, look at the pace that I'm working. I'm in no rush, really taking my time. And it's the, it's the pace that I'm working that allows me the precision. If I make a mark, if I'm working at this pace and the marks that I'm making are still a little bit messy, I will slow down. Again, I'll, I'll keep slowing down my pace a little bit at a time until I get to the point where every mark that I, that I make is what I intend it to be. That's how you get control. Control, you know, control of the marks that you make is almost entirely built around the speed at which you work. If you're making marks accidentally, or if you're not in control of those marks, the answer is always the same to fix that problem. Slow down. Again, it doesn't mean going from 100 miles an hour down to 3 miles an hour. It could be the difference between going from 100 miles an hour down to 90 miles an hour. Just a little bit slower. If 90 miles an hour is still giving you mistakes in the marks you're making, slow it down a little more. Bring it down to 80, 85. Again, a little bit at a time until you find that sweet spot where you're working at a good pace, but also not tripping up because you're moving too fast through areas. And you're gonna find also some areas you can work faster than others. Not every area is going to require a slow, um, a slow pass. I can work in here much faster than I can put this edge in. This requires greater care. And so knowing where I can move quickly and where I can't, and again, that's, some of it is just experience, some of it is just common sense. Big open areas, you can move quickly. When you get to a detailed edge, something that has to be clean and precise, you've got to dial it back. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the apron as a vacant shadows painting, meaning that I'm leaving all the shadows in the white the color that's already down. I'm just leaving them alone. I will glaze them later on in my next pass in order to bring them more in line color and value-wise with what I want them to be at the end of the painting. But for now, I'm just leaving them as holes. The shadows are just going to be holes in the painting, allowing this gold to show through. Right? And part of the reason that I'm doing that is that the gold that's down right now is going to be arguably the unifying factor between all the things that are gold in the final painting. Right? So they're gonna, it's, these, these shades are going to be the shadows in, in all of the gold on here. In here, in here, and even in here. And so as a starting point, since it's unifying so much of the little detail, um, it can be used as a unifying factor for the entire apron. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let the gold, this darker gold, unify everything. And then I'll just tweak the color a little for where it's white. So I'll make it a little bit grayer. For the places where it's purple, I might make it a little bit, a little bit grayer as well, darker and grayer. Um, and that'll be done with the glaze. And what that does is that saves me the burden of having to paint both the lights and the shadows um, at this point when I'm putting in the apron. And it's not that I can't do that, but my personal feeling is, one, it's more work. And I'm not, I'm not saying that like I'm shying away from the work, but it doesn't give me a better effect. This works beautifully, um, and it's less work. So I win on both fronts. <clears throat> and that's what I want. I want the best result possible for the least amount of work, and I never want to sacrifice quality for speed.
This apron already looks better than the photograph, in my opinion. What was that? This apron already looks better than the photograph, in my opinion. Sadly, I can't leave it the way it is. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta bring it more in line with the photograph as I go. It's got a really nice feel at the moment. The vibration between the the, the purple and the uh, and the what will eventually be gold is so nice right now. Uh, it's also so well unified to the rest of the painting. Yeah. And hopefully that will stay. Yes, a, a lot of what unifies it. So, like the unifying element is this color. It's here. It's in all of the gold. It's even arguably in the face of the book. It's in the it's in the columns in the background. And so, I'm just listening. All right. So we've got this unifying color that's creeping up through the painting. It's everywhere, and so it helps to keep everything feeling like it's in the same space. And even the stuff back in here, if you look in here, some of what's under here looks like this. It's not that far apart. These kind of orangish colors, they're peeking through. They're in here, even up in here, because of how the painting was built up. This held, this color, in, to some degree, held a lot of the real estate of the original pass. And so now that it's, now it's being allowed to peek through in some places, it's still, it's still, it, become, it becomes a glue that holds everything together. Little hints of it. That's what I was saying. Like if I fill, if I fill the purple and none of this, this orange or this tan shows through, the purple feels completely separated from it. But if I allow enough of it to show through that you don't see the orange, but it's there, it kind of tempers the purple and makes the purple feel connected to the gold. Like these are on completely different ends of the color spectrum, yet they feel unified. And what it is is one, you know, we talk about this like peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Value-wise, they're not that different. Color-wise, they're on completely different ends of the spectrum. But from a value standpoint, up in here, these are not a drastic jump, not like this. And so that, that works. But also this color is peeking through just about everything here. The only place where it's not showing really is in the jacket. Everything else in here, all of the purple has some of it showing through. Even the flag up in here, we've got this red, but this is coming off the same color family. Even in the blues, we have these tans kind of showing through. And so it helps to bring the painting together. It helps to make it feel like it's all, it's the, everything in this painting is breathing the same air. It's, it's all, it's just in that exact same space. And again, the red book by itself, it starts to look cut out if it doesn't have anything from around it incorporated into it. And so that first pass that I did, when I blew out the edges and I dragged the red out into here and the black into here, and the, you know, I sprawled these, these things out and took their edges away and eliminated the boundaries, was the beginning of allowing these things to become, to, you know, one object to integrate itself color-wise into the objects next to it, marrying them. And so, and it's just, it's carrying through the process as I'm building it up. Um, and again, you can do this directly. You can paint mark by mark on a white canvas and do this, but it is a lot of work to be able to incorporate, to make this purple with some hint of this in it without this color wiping out the color of the purple, right? And, and across the painting, I'm just capitalizing on that, you know, the, the paint being a little thicker or a little thinner and allowing the under th the under the things that, that are underneath to show through just a little bit. Again, there's no orange visible in the violet, but it's there. It's there just enough that it connects these things. Again, the jacket's the only thing that doesn't have any of that showing through. And I don't want it showing through on the jacket because the jacket, in a very large part, is what pulls him away from the background. All of these things. The purple separates itself, but all the golds feel more like the background than they do like the foreground. So I'm going to use the blacks and the whites to pull him away, and even the, even the, the lights on the violet. But I'm going to use all these golds in here as a unifying factor to keep him connected to the space. And again, Nick, this is a lot to juggle on a big painting. Right, and so, like if you were doing this and painting it mark by mark, filling one thing at a time, this would be a, a, 
I don't want to say an impossible task because it's possible, but it would be so much work. Doing it the way I'm doing it, I set the stage with the first pass. The second pass, I'm only allowing, like I'm putting down only what I need and allowing the connective, um, you know, allowing the things to peek through it. I can just kind of scrub away where I want. If I had more, more artistic license, there's actually more I would do to open up these violets and allow even more of the gold. Down in here, I would scrub this away and allow the purple to kind of grade and fade away into these golds down here with just a dusting of violet. And it would have really kind of revved this up a bit. But again, I'm not taking, I'm not taking any, any artistic license in that way with this painting because it can't be more, it can't be stylized away from what the rest of the collection looks like. So, uh, but if I were doing this purely for myself, I would have opened this up and allowed some of these um, some of these golds to show through even in a much greater way in the uh, in the purple. And then when I was doing the details, I might detail this up in here and slowly drop the details off and let them fade away and just leave this with the blown out um, open kind of color of violet letting the oranges show through. It would give a really beautiful, it would feel almost like a, uh, like a beautiful sunset. Kind of the, the sun, the orange of the sun kind of pushing out the other colors and kind of overtaking them. Um, I actually thought about it. It had crossed my mind to do that yesterday and I, I, I restrained myself. Because <laughs> I know how beautiful it would look. I, um, but again, it, it's a, it would be too much of a departure from what I am supposed to be doing here. And so I, I decided not to do it. I'm, gonna, I'm staying strict to, um, I'm staying strict to the project as it, as it was meant to be done. And the painting's not gonna be any less beautiful for it. Uh, it's not like I have these ideas and they'll make the painting beautiful and otherwise it's gonna be ugly. It's not like that. These are, these are artistic decisions um, and they're specific to me. Like where I would take this, if it was mine going on my wall or, or if I was doing it specifically for a gallery and I had the choice to make it whatever I wanted, yeah, I would handle some things a little differently. But the painting won't be diminished um, for the lack of my voice in some of these things. If I felt that that was actually going to be the case, I would probably take certain liberties. I would never de deliver a painting that was less than it could be within the parameters of, of the job. Um, so this would be an artistic choice, but it's not necessary to make the painting everything that it, everything that it can be within the, the guidelines of, of the commission. down a little bit, just make sure it's even, I'll then go back in, I'll soften any edges I want soft. A lot of the edges in here I can get away with leaving them just the way they are because they're going to be overwritten um, when I lay in the details of the gold, 
and most of this is bumping up against gold. There are a few places like this edge is a cat is a shadow. I've got to soften. But a lot of these things they got to bump up against against sharp details later on, and so I can I'm going to have to render in those edges. And so at that time, if I need to soften an edge, I can do it. I'm going to be I'm going to be stuck to a degree doing it anyway as I render those edges in, um, those details like the embroidery and that kind of stuff. And so since I'm going to have to do it at that point anyway, there's no reason to do it here because I do do it here and then I have to do it again in the next pass when I lay in the embroidery. So I'll just do it in one of the passes. And again, even going over this in this way is going to soften my edges a little bit. I'm going to have to clean some things up a little in here. Just wipe away. But see, this was sealed the other day, so it'll wipe up very easily. And all I'm doing is knocking the paint down, allowing some of the gold to show through, just like what we were talking about. Don't want these things too solid. I can always bulk them up later on, but getting the gold to peek through it later is not going to be possible because it's a matter of this pass being thin enough um, and allowing some of what's underneath to show through it. Once this is solid and it's dry, I will not be able to undo that. So I do it now. Just kind of knock it down, diminish it a little bit, let the thing that the unifying color, the thing that unifies the painting, show through even a little bit. And it, um, it'll help to pull this white and make it part of, part of the painting. And again, some of this stuff, I'm just going to wipe it out after I'm done. All right, so. All right, so even going in with a brush, I can just kind of scrub away some of the stuff, some of the white that's been dragged down in here. And again, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be cleaned up so I don't have any distinct brush marks. start just taking down some of the edges that I want softer and then I'll be able to move on and get some of the, the other purple in and then this thing will be done. So these edges are all good. This edge needs to be softened. Now, even though this edge is being softened, it's the bottom of this shadow. Right now, it's kind of frosting over the gold in here, but that's going to wind up being glazed in later on with a gray um, to establish the darker shadow on, on the white. So I'm just looking to, I'm just thinking about the edge right now. I'm not worried about the color or the value, particularly as I'm dealing with this. I'm worried about, and I'm thinking specifically about the edge, so that when I put that, that darker shade in here as a glaze, how does it play against that edge? Does this edge feel like it's fading into this and underneath that shadow? And 
Again, all I'm doing is knocking down the edge, taking that sharp edge away. Doesn't have to be silk smooth, just needs to feel like a, it needs to feel different. Like this edge needs to feel different than this edge. That's all I'm looking for, nothing more. attention to the little details. In here, you have these tassels and they're casting a shadow. They kind of start very close and then they pull out and they go through here. This light and these lights are being shown through the light that's getting through the tassel. And so I want to make sure that I've diminished them so they don't look like the lights that are, that are being hit directly on the, the front of that leather. And so I'm also taking the edges down. I'm paying attention to what these edges are doing. Are they going underneath, are they, do they have to be soft because they're kind of creeping out from underneath something or are they the end of an object where something bumps up against something else? I'm trying to distinguish them much like I did up in here. And again, I'd rather err on the side of having an edge that's too soft than one that's too sharp. A sharp edge can be put in later on very easily. A graded edge, very hard to create after something dries with a sharp edge. Let me go. <clears throat> I'm watching the value. This in here is nowhere near as light as this. Just like these are not as light as what's out here. <clears throat> so I want to make sure that I'm expressing that. So I don't have to explain it later on um, by knocking these things down with a glaze. This allows me to let the gold show through. If I have to fix that later on and push it from this value to that value, I'm gonna glaze it with something else. It's probably not gonna match this color very well. So I'm trying to take advantage of what's already down. I'm trying to eliminate more work for myself. I'm trying to keep, trying to make sure that everything that I'm doing is moving the painting towards the end result rather than kind of creating a lateral move and then forcing me to take a bigger step later on to finish.
and just, just knocking down these edges. I know this tassel is going to be very soft. I want to have a hard edge here where the tassel bumps up against this. Just soften it a little bit. In between the violet and the white, there's kind of a drop off, and so you're seeing this nice warmth kind of rolling between them. It gives a nice, a not really nice feel. Um, I couldn't do that if the orange were wet, but when I put the violet and the white down and I let some of this peek through, it is beautiful vibration on that edge. Be surprised like how much random orange you can allow to show through this stuff, and the painting will still feel completely solid. Um, I'm probably I'm probably letting through a lot less than I could, and still wind up with this really really incredible visual. Still been out of connection. Still been out. Yeah. Well. And so I've put this here so that this is now my palette. I'm going to be able to move back and forth and back and forth because I have a lot of little marks in here to do. The little in between the links on the chains. And so I don't want to be bouncing back and forth between the palette on my left. I'll spend more time moving from here to the palette than I will actually paint it. So like this, I can now just grab my paint from here. Notice I've gone down to a fairly small brush and I'm now just gonna start. calculate all the time I spend with my brush off the canvas going to the palette and then coming back probably over this painting it's going to account for several hours so this is going to eliminate that time and again it's such a small space where I'm using a very small brush oh the number of times I'm going to go back and forth is going to be it's just going to be way too much for me to be playing that game so I just want to kind of figure out figure out the pattern. There's not a lot going on here, but some of these some of these rings are opened and you can see a lot of valley like here. There's a lot of white showing through and down in here there's a lot of purple. So I want to make sure I get that in. At least the beginnings of it. The places where it's like distinctly purple. I want to make sure I'm I'm accounting for that.
Do you want to just re-explain why you've put the paint there? Yeah, we're back up. Yeah. So what I've done is I've I've taken a couple of pieces of tape, I kind of rub my fingers on the back of it so it's not so sticky. Again, it's a low-tack tape anyway, but and I've moved my purple up here. And the reason that I've done it is I'm now working with a very small brush, and literally almost every single mark I make is going to require me to go back and get more paint. The amount of time that I'll spend going back and forth to the palette to get paint will 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 probably be 10 times the amount of time I'm actually painting because the brush is only going to grab so much paint at a time. So I've moved this up here and I've put some paint up here, so I'm literally just going here, boom, 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 boom. Now I'm saving time, okay? On big stuff that's not needed, but if you get into like tight details, this is a wonderful way to save a lot of time. Again, I'm sure if we went back into the video and watched how much time I spent going from here to my palette and from my palette back up here, it would account for what could be half of the time I've spent painting. So if I could cut that in half, I'm eliminating all of that from the painting process. And what that means is that I can do, like let's say that half of my time is spent painting, half of my time is spent traveling to the palette and back. If I can eliminate half of the travel time, a painting that only takes me 75% of the time to complete, Every four paintings I do, or actually every three paintings I do, right? Every three? Every three or every four paintings I do, I get to add another painting without adding more hours to my work schedule because instead of spending the time going back and forth to the palette, I'm now working right here. I can take those hours and apply them to a new painting. New, more paintings in a year means more income. So from a, from a business standpoint, keeping your palette close helps. It speeds you up. Again, not for everything. But when I start getting into these tight details where I know I'm going to be running back and forth and back and forth to the palette, definitely that's a good time to do it. And so what I've done here is I've just dropped, these are some of the openings in the chain um, that are showing through. Um, not all of them, a little bit hard to figure out where everything goes. I've got a couple of landmarks and that's really, really what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to get some, some landmarks in place. Um, and that's about it. I'm gonna, I'll be, most of the work will be done when I land my highlights. Apologize about the in and out on the internet here. It's probably driving us almost as crazy as it's driving you. Fortunately, there's not much we can do about it. We are working on doing something else for tomorrow that'll make sure this is not the case.
I mean, I'm putting these in as details, but I'm going to take a fan brush and knock them down. It's going to blur out the edges. They're not going to be nearly so precise when I'm all done. Same with this. I'm make sure all this stuff is going to soften up a little bit. Just looking to get some landmarks. And on this side, I can't see anything, but here I've got a pretty decent sense of um, my transfer. And I, not that I put everything in, but I, I have some general shapes here that I can make sense of. I'm not going to try to paint every single link as it looks. I'm trying to get a general sense of what's going on here, fill in some of the darks, and then when I put in the lights, I'll see what the mechanics of this are, and I will simply render it. Um, once I understand the pattern, I'll render it just to give the impression. Um, it's too much information to go in. And let me rephrase that. It's not too much to go into link by link, but Painting it link by link does not necessarily give the best, the best result as a finished painting. And so I don't want to, I don't want to do all of that labor and not get the return for it. So an impressionist, impressionist marks here that give the, that, that explain the chains without rendering them is going to be a better, is going to be a better fit for this painting. This is only a focal point while we're looking at it and working on it. It's not a focal point in the whole painting. And so I want to be careful. Like when we work, it's so easy to lose track of what matters and what doesn't based on where we're looking. When I'm working on this, it can feel like it's the most important thing in the world. But if I step away from the painting, it is almost irrelevant in the overall painting. It's not structural. It doesn't, it doesn't express anything other than a, a decorative element in the painting. And so I want to be very careful about getting to a point where, because I'm focusing on it, that I start treating it with a level of reverence that it does not deserve. And again, that's not to say that I'm just blowing it off and not worrying about it. I'm treating it with great care, but I want to be careful about elevating its, its status in the painting that it, that it, one, eats up the clock in a place where I could be spending my time on something that's actually much more important to the overall painting. But also, I, like I said, I, I don't like to spend my time on things that don't move the overall forward. I want the painting, the whole painting, to move forward. And if I spend an hour on this when I could have spent 10 minutes, and the hour doesn't yield anything anything more impactful for the overall painting, to me it feels like wasted time. And it's not to say, look, I mean, if I render this stuff and, I, and I, this stuff becomes what we call eye candy, I mean, you could just get lost in the links if they're painted, if they're painted every single link and they're exquisite and, you know, really just rendered. But it, in the overall painting, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything. Doesn't, it doesn't move, it doesn't move the dialogue of the painting forward. It's a decorative element, and I want to make sure that I leave it there. I want to make sure that it doesn't start to take on a life of its own and become more than it, than it was intended to be um, at the outset of this. And again, these things, they do have a way of kind of creeping in and forcing your hand. This is another reason why I don't like to go in and do detail first. Right, so if, and I, I've been talking about this all along, if I put in really sharp edges, those sharp edges then force me to make things that might be sharper. Like, so if I do the jacket and I put in a sharp edge, the jacket's a soft material, so what do I do when I get to metal? Now it's gotta be hyper sharp. And hyper sharp demands detail. It demands not just the edges are sharp, but they are precise, they're specific. What I'm doing right now, because everything else is soft, I'm going to be given the freedom to pick and choose where I put in sharp edges. Even in this metal, I'm not going to have to put in the kind of details that, that would be forced if these other things were sharper to start with. And so this is one of the reasons why I stay away from the sharp, hyper-specific marks, um, and I, I hold them off till the very end of the process.
just, I don't want my hand forced. I want to be able to pick and choose where things go and how sharp they are along the way. So I'm kind of coming up on these, trying to figure out like, like ball one, ball two, ball three. Now I'm kind of climbing my way back up to make sure that all of these, because right, the chain is not as important as what's down at the bottom. The bottom really helps to define like, each one of these steel balls. So I want to make sure what I have at the bottom is very specific, um, that I'm expanding and contracting the shapes to explain these balls down at the bottom. Even though I have a transfer, doesn't mean that I'm able to make sense of every mark. I have to be very thoughtful about what's in this photograph as I'm going. Otherwise, I'm going to wind up with marks that don't make sense. And then on top of that, I'm going to, when I do my next pass, I'm going to be looking at these things thinking that everything is right, um, depending on the marks that I made to, to get me across the finish line. But the marks won't necessarily do that for me. And like I said, there are a lot of marks here that don't make any sense in what I'm looking at. So I'm, if I can't make sense of it, I then fall back on what I'm seeing and I just overwrite them. Again, you have to be able to depend on your, your own, not, I don't want to say opinion because it's not opinion, but it's your own ability to perceive. Don't lean on the photograph so heavily or the transfer so heavily. It's a guide. It's, it's there to help but it's not meant to define every mark you put down. Um, it becomes a crutch when you get there, and you don't want to be dependent on things in that way, but it's going to hold you back as an artist. And I can tell you that from experience. I didn't start out working from direct observation, and I, and it was a, I really kind of surrendered a lot of ground. Um, A lot of your skills are going to come from working from direct observation. They really are. And I know a lot of people shy away from it. They struggle a little bit with it and they, they back away and they just kind of, they just give it away. They don't, they don't learn it because it's a challenge. But the truth is that you need to be able to work from direct observation confidently. Um, because even stuff like this, if I wasn't comfortable with my ability to assess these things, again, even with the photograph, I was depending on these, this transfer, I'd be in trouble. I'd be in real trouble because there's nothing here. stop there as far as adding in new stuff. I'm just going to knock this down. That's going to be good enough for me to then build my lights on top of. It just, it explains the overall links. We can see that they're, they're pretty organized here, so I know that I've basically got it right. And I'm just going to knock them down. I'm going to let them kind of blur, spread out, take a little bit more space. Um, that way these marks don't force me I'm going to be able to play with them, utilize them, but not be dictated to buy them. Again, if they're too sharp, they're going to start dictating what has to go on top. So I'm just going to knock them back. And I'm, I'm being pretty aggressive with the fan brush. There's not a lot of paint here, so it's not going anywhere really. And it's allowing, again, this orange to show through. Making sure my edges are soft. And that's good enough. That'll 
that'll take care of me. And then same on this side, actually even a little bit more aggressive because these are quite a bit less obvious than these links. So again, just knocking everything down, allowing that gold to show through. Good, I think that, that should actually work nicely. Um, there's not a lot of paint on there. I had grabbed the big fan brush, but the truth is there's nothing here to move. It's all, it's all already completely knocked down. There's no, no paint to move around. So, uh, I'm now gonna start, I think I'm gonna come across here and then work my way up. And that will, that'll resolve the apron, at least for now, for what we're gonna be doing on it. Okay. And since I've got paint here, I'm just gonna work from this. And so you remember yesterday I was talking about how I found a little pinch point here that I could break. So all I have to do is marry this little edge into this. So even if my collar is a little bit off, I'm just going to lightly dust this out into here and just kind of just let it kind of feather out into what's already down. This is still a little bit wet. I have to be very careful about lifting what's down. I match these colors pretty well, so I'm not too concerned about one being a little bit different than the other. They're very close. Maybe not a perfect match, but they're really close. Um, and again, I think with the, you know, with the amount of orange that the, this gold that I'm letting show through, whatever variation is in the paint I'm putting down from what went down yesterday, the gold is gonna kind of neutralize it and, you know, it's all gonna look fine. And again, we're not talking about a two value jump or a completely different color. They are really close. Um, on the palette, I can see the difference when they touch, but if I separate them, they look identical. And so for me, that's close enough. And I have a pretty good, I have a pretty good eye for this stuff, just because I've been doing it for so long. So if if I can't see the difference with them being one inch apart, they're close. my transfer as I go or watching my reference material to make sure that I'm not stating something incorrectly. I want to make sure that I'm faithfully representing what's here. Right? And again, so like so let's say you're doing a painting like this and you have no idea what these things mean. You have to be very careful to actually put in what you see. Right? If you if you know what they are, then you then you know what the value of them is and and like which ones have to be exact, because maybe some of these, they have to be exactly what they are, and some of them, there's latitude on them. Like, if you don't know what this stuff is, you wouldn't be able to make a decision about that. And so, in that case, you have to be very careful to faithfully represent what you are seeing, right? Um, because the likelihood that the people looking at this who know what it is will know if it's wrong. So you want to make sure that you're not putting anything, you're not putting anything out there that is potentially, um, that's potentially wrong. And it's also possible that there's a broad, uh, a 
broad range of latitude on this as well. If you know that that's the case, then you have a little bit more flexibility. I imagine that these are very specific images, like these things. They're very specific, but they're also stylized. Um, that makes sense, that they would be, that they are, they're stylized based on the person who made the apron. And so there is some flexibility in that, but at the same time, this apron might be specific to this person. And I'm talking about this, this um, in particular, but this could be anything that you, anything that you paint, right? So even if you, like, so let's say you do a painting of somebody in a space in their home, and in the background, in let's say, let's say in their in their living room, there's a something on the a little pot on the fireplace, like on the mantel. And you think nothing of the pot, and you just paint it, and you kind of take liberties with it, and then you find out that that pot is like 16 generations old in their family, and it's the only thing, like they came over on the Mayflower with it, and that pot is the only thing that's still, and then you took liberties with it and made it something that it's not, right? You might think nothing of it. Knowing what's in your painting, what its value is, is important if you don't have that information to be as faithful in your representation of it as you could possibly be. You never really know what is going to be important in somebody else's painting, right? Because it's not your, like I'm doing a portrait, it's not my painting, it's, it's their painting. Well, actually, yeah, we're doing great on time. We should get this done by four o'clock. Should not be a problem. And there's not much left to do. The, the vibe is gonna, um, basically it's, it's all that's left. Just a little bit of vibe. Um, there's not a lot going on up in here. Any questions as we're going? While the stuff is easy, I'm happy to take questions.
again, just keeping an eye on what I'm doing here. I don't want to, some of the lines are not obvious. Again, the transfer shows through in some places, not so much in others. There are streaks of paint that look like transfer lines that are not. And I'm having to negotiate that terrain. Again, the transfers, transfers offer some, some great assistance in some ways, but you sacrifice in others. There are things that you give away if you, if you expect everything to come from the transfer and you expect to be able to lean on it heavily through the process. It, it, it starts to demand more in a lot of cases than it gives. So you do want to be careful about that. You want to get to a point where you are not dependent, but that a transfer becomes like a, a friend that you can depend on for certain things, but you still do most things on your own, right? So you want you want that transfer to be an ally, not to become something you become so dependent on that you can't, you don't feel comfortable doing for yourself about it. Um, and that's the case with every tool you have. Um, you want to make sure that you are comfortable with whatever you're dealing with. You're working indoors, you're working outdoors, you're working with bristle brushes or sables or like on, on panel, on canvas. Um, all of these different things, you want to be comfortable with all of them. The big one though is being comfortable being able to work with or, with a, with or without a photograph, with or without a transfer, right? Because you can work from a photograph and not use a transfer. You can work from life, you wouldn't use a transfer. You want to be comfortable so that the choice is yours where you use one or the other. You don't want to find yourself in a place where you are wholly dependent on a tool. And so without the tool, you're paralyzed. You can't make art. It's a terrible place to be. And again, I'm telling you from experience, it's a terrible place to be. I wasn't always able to do what I do now. Um, there was a time that I didn't know how to paint. I never painted from life. And um, I mean, I think I talked about it here a little bit, but it's a terrible place to be. Um, you feel like, you, like you're entirely dependent in order to be able to, to have, to be able to voice your opinion about, about something, like to be able to make a piece of art that is your voice. Like if I want to paint something, that I would have to first kind of sketch it out and then do a photo shoot and then run prints and then do a transfer and then I could start talking. You want to be able to just grab a piece of canvas and grab some paint and start expressing yourself in a meaningful way. And if you are wholly dependent on a material like a, like a transfer, it's going to get in the way of you being able to create. Um, and it's going, to, it's going to get in the way a lot. It might not start off that way, but eventually it's going to get in the way of everything you want to do. And it's better to develop the skill before you become frustrated with the fact that you don't have the skill. Because by the time you get there, now ego starts creeping in. You're, you're great at producing paintings, right? This is where I was. I was great at producing finished paintings, but I couldn't do it from direct observation. So I didn't want to go to places where I would learn how to paint from direct observation because I was embarrassed that I was painting at this level for my illustrations and I couldn't paint at all from life. And so instead of being able to go into places where I was a novice across the board and develop the skill equally as I came up, I had to kind of humble myself and, um, and, and accept that I didn't know how, that I was, I was basically an absolute beginner in one end of art, where on the other end, I was an expert. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's just not an easy thing to do. Um, there aren't many places in life that you would have to do that. And so, um, you know, ego, ego made it very hard to kind of allow myself to go into these places where I would be able to get an education to help me. So I wanted doing it alone on my own, which again, is a mountain climb. It's, it's not something you want to do if you don't have to. You want to be around people who can help you, who can guide you. And so if you do it all, all while you're learning, you'll never find yourself in a place where you have to accept that you don't know something you should. 
in order to be the artist you want to be. Right? You kind of sidestepped it early. And we have people in the program, um, we have people in the program that have kind of found their way around some of the working from direct observation. This is for, not just for, for people in the program, but for anybody. And so we have people in the program where they're supposed to work from direct observation every other painting once they're into the program. And so they'll do one from a photograph where they have a transfer and they do all of that. And then the next one, they have to do the proportional drawing and do the entire painting from direct observation. And we found that there are some students that it was, it was, too, um, it was too challenging compared to working from the, the photograph where they had all those crutches, that they would take a picture of their still life and then work from the photograph. But what that does is it allows that skill set to lag. And you pay for it later on. You pay for it in, in limited skill development. You, 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 you lose the ability to be confident in tackling whatever is put in front of you. There's, there's so many things that are lost in the process. And let me tell you, learning to draw in proportion doesn't just teach you how to draw in proportion. The skills that you utilize, the neural pathways that are opened up, that are created specifically for that skill, are not proportional drawing neural pathways. They are perception. They are how you see, how your brain processes visual stimulation. And so when you're learning to draw in proportion, measuring off of a table, you're learning to see color properly. You're learning to see value properly, edges properly, because what those neural pathways are doing is they are giving you greater access to the ability to see things for what they are and to process them. And if you sidestep the proportional drawing, you lose all of the additional benefits that come from it. And so always best, like develop all the skills equally and bring them up. It's gonna slow you down a little bit at the beginning. And some of it might be a little frustrating, but like, just get through it. On the other side of it, the benefits, you know, they're, they're, they, can't be, they can't be overstated. Steve Moran said, still going. You're like the Duracell rabbit. <laughs> How do you stay focused for so long? Four to five hours, I'm shot. I don't know. Oh, did you go to work and come and you're done now already? <laughs> you know what it is, Steve? I, I ate my Wheaties this morning. And you know what's funny, when I leave here today, I've got a photo shoot to do. I got a, probably a two hour photo shoot after I leave here. So. What for? Uh, full time student. Nice. Yeah, just a little time. I don't have a lot left to do in here. It's actually fairly, fairly thin. Just got to figure out some of the shapes. And in fact, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm just gonna fill in this little bit, and I'm gonna finish this off. Then I'll come in and I'll knock this out again. Better for me to take all these edges down. The paint is really nice and wet right now, so I'm just looking for a place where I can end where I'm, where I'm filling.
just want to make sure I haven't missed anything. And again, like this is what I read on the tape. You see, I'm kind of going over every contour to make sure nothing's been missed. Um, takes a second or so, um, but it's worth doing. It, it, you see, like when I was doing this, I missed the flag um, in when I first started working. And I, like I, I went back in and I did it later on, but had I caught it earlier, it would have been less work for me. Um, and so here, I just want to make sure, I want to make sure that I've got everything. It takes takes just a few seconds to check it. And it, while the paint is wet, and it's on my palette, and it's on my brush, and I'm working, better to just get it, get it checked here. Again, nothing wrong with proofing your work over and over and over, rather than coming back later on and realizing you missed something somewhere. And now you've got, now you've got real labor attached to fixing it. Those fixes are always surgical, they're always a lot of work. So you want to make sure that, that you're not causing that problem for yourself if you don't have to. And again, like even here, kind of breaking up this edge, letting it dissolve into the background. Again, if I, there's some gold in there that'll get dropped in, but it's, it's nice that I can just dissolve it and let it fade away. And that edge may wind up staying that way through the process. I may, may decide that it looks better that way, um, that it contributes to the painting. more this way than if I define it better. So, so home stretch here on this apron. I got I, I'm not seeing, I'm not really seeing any lines here. And all of my transfer lines are gone. So I'm starting by defining, based on what I do have here, defining where these edges are. Right, so this tassel comes up. landmarks. So across from the bottom of this buckle is where this is kind of widest and where this there's a there's a decorative element right there. So I gotta try to place that that decorative element. So I'm looking at, it starts at the same place as the bottom of this buckle. So I'm gonna probably kind of space this, get the purple in here. And then I'm gonna figure out where it comes down to. It comes down to about the top of the eyelid on this. So it comes down to about here. trying to figure out landmarks. And it's funny, like if I find a landmark, so I don't see lines, but when I come across here and I'm trying to find the bottom of this round thing, right, this thing on this side, I figured out that at the bottom of the sun, if I go across, that's where it is. And it's not just the bottom of this, but there's this leaf in here. And when I got there, all of a sudden I can see these two little marks peeking through the paint. And I know, because I knew where the mark should be, now I can see the transfer, I can see those marks, but they were buried under the paint until then. It was only because I was able to locate them that I can now see them. And I wouldn't be able to find them if I didn't know how to plumb line and utilize what's here to figure out where things are, which is a drawing from direct observation skill. That's not a skill you pick up by doing photographs, that's a skill you pick up from working um, from direct observation because this mark is relative to something else here. This mark is relative to something else here. That's proportional drawing. 
And so I'm utilizing that exact same skill to figure out where these marks go. And in doing that, once I find where the mark goes, then it's like, oh, well, there's the transfer line. I can see it now. It was buried, but I see it now. Um, because I know where I'm looking. And that's not always gonna be the case. Sometimes there'll be no line. But that's okay, because if you know where the mark goes, you don't need the line. I'm using the line right now just to confirm that I found the thing. Right, to me, that's what I'm looking at. I'm like, you know, the fact that there was a line there when I started to put a mark just confirms that I got it in the right place. That's all it's doing. Because the mark was going down there regardless. I had determined where it, where it belonged. Finding the line is just confirmation of the fact that the mark that I, that I, where I believe the mark was supposed to go is actually where it's supposed to go. Basically got all that purple in place. Just kind of fan brush, knock it down. Even with all the technical difficulties, we will be done in, at four o'clock today. That's nice. I think that's the first day that we actually did that. <laughs> Not anything at four, but actually getting everything done at four mm. on, on our schedule. And again, take the edges down. I'm pretty aggressive with this. I don't, this stuff is so obscured over here. Anything that looks even relatively sharp is gonna, is going to become a problem. Let this thing just drop off. This is gonna be sharper. This is like, again, as you're going around the form, you're losing some of the some of the particulars it's so easy to look here and see everything sharp but if you look at the whole apron this is much more focused than this even here this is sharp but this isn't because it's rolling away it's not on the same plane and we want to make sure that we're we're giving that impression again remember what we're doing here in making a painting is not replicating what we see but creating an illusion of this subject taking up this space it's not real and so replicating the photograph doesn't make it any more real. It's, it's the artist being able to take what they're seeing and make sense of it um, so that it better represents what you would naturally see with your eyes. And that requires, I mean, you have to have experience, you have to have knowledge, but it, it requires deviating from the source material at some point. Um, and so me taking these edges down and giving myself the room um, to hint at things here and maybe have even softer edges than water in the photograph 
to give a greater impression of this turning away and being a receding plane as a proso as opposed to the frontal plane which is in focus. When I say frontal plane and receding, I mean the front of him and then the, the side of him going back into space. This is going to be more focused than, than the stuff back in here. And that's all I'm doing is I'm turning the form here, I'm getting rid of getting rid of the sharp edges. Again, I can put the sharp edges in later, because these do have to be sharp relative to the stuff in the background. But I don't want these to be so sharp that I then have to make these hyper sharp. And so I'm just taking it down. Again, I've been saying this over and over, but sharp edges are very hard to get rid of to turn into gradients later, where gradients are very easy to turn into sharp edges later. So, very, very gently kind of peel this away. Careful not to damage my paint. And again, when I, you didn't see me when I put this on, but I take the tape and I go back and forth and back and forth. I'm like getting some of the tack off the, the sticky nature of the, the tape. I'm trying to break it down. So when I put it here, it doesn't really grab. And this is, this is uh, painter's tape, so it's, it's a low tack anyway. It's not really grabbing a hold of this. Um, in here, we, put our, we tape our pictures up, our photographs with it, and our photographs are constantly falling off of our work because it's a low tack tape. You don't want to use like real masking tape because it's going to grab a hold of this and leave behind residue or even tear uh, paint away um, later on. So I think, I think I got everything. So I want to just step back. I want to step back and get a look at it before I kind of go in and say, yeah, I'm done. I'm gonna look over, the collar is all dried and set in. This is drying up and so they're taking on different colors. But I wanna make sure I haven't missed an area that is supposed to have purple or white. And once I know that I have everything in place, I'm gonna come, so I'm gonna do that from a few feet back. I'm then gonna come up and I'm gonna make sure that I haven't left a sharp edge someplace that I need a graded edge. Again, I'm, I'm looking over this thing. I'm being meticulous, object to object, shape to shape. I'm trying to make as close an assessment as I can. I don't want to leave anything undone and be stuck having to do it. Again, mix a new color and, and, and surgically repair something that I could have very easily handled right now. I'm feeling pretty good. I'm not not seeing anything in here that I've missed. So, so now, like I know all of this is fine, I'm just gonna check this. I'm comfortable with placement of everything. I just wanna make sure all the places where I want a diminished value, that I've got it compared to something bolder, and that I've got sharp and graded edges in place. Again, my graded edges here don't have to be very soft, because they're really, I'm going to be glazing over them, kind of, kind of rolling back in the other direction, which will create a secondary gradient going in the other direction with a glaze. But I do want them to be um, distinctly softer than the than the sharp edges. And again, like you can see this, I see a little bit more of an edge in here that I want. I'm just going to kind of tap the very edge of the paint. And again, it's subtle. There's not much going on here. Probably could have left it just the way it was, but I'm kind of nitpicking. Again, we've got a gradient in here. All of this is sharp. Um, it's all good. So I got a gradient here and here. This is softened. This is softened. This edge is softened. This is from yesterday. I know that the tassels actually dropped down in front of it, so I didn't soften it. All of this in here is going to be sharp except for this edge, which is relatively sharp up here and becomes very soft down here. And the same over here. This is relatively sharp and then it becomes soft down in here. I feel like this could be a little softer. And again, 
again, I'd rather it be too soft than not soft enough. These are all diminished values up in here. These are all solid whites. Good to go. Um, again, as I'm working, I'm always doing this. I'm always checking, checking the work I've done to make sure that I've not missed anything. I don't want to pack it in and find that I left, I left a one-inch area undone, and then I come in tomorrow and I have to break from what I want to do to, to fix that thing when I could take just a couple of minutes, just kind of calm down, slow everything down, take a good look at where I am and where I've got, and see if I've got everything in place before kind of jumping into the next thing. And so I'm feeling really good about where this painting is right now. Everything is coming along beautifully. Um, I've actually not hit any hiccups in the process so far. Um, the, only, the only place that's really slowed me down at all along the way is losing some of the transfer marks in places like this, but um, and even like in the shirt, I like I placed this in improperly, um, and so. Um, but for the most part, everything is kind of really just kind of moving along, and it's doing that because I'm planning before I paint. Everything I do, I'm planning it out. I have an overarching idea. I know where I'm starting and where I'm going to. And so I have that plan, I have the destination in mind, I already know what it's gonna be for the most part. Um, and then each day I'm coming to the painting and I'm building on what came before it. So I'm kind of course correcting along the way, but there are no drastic jumps because I, I, I have the overarching plan and then I have all the little plans that equal the end goal. And I'm flexible enough that I'm able to step away from something if it's not working or see something that that might give me a better result, better or faster. And there have been a few times here where I've been like, okay, I'm gonna switch up what I was gonna do and I'm gonna do this other thing. And then I'm like, mm, you know what, actually no. My original idea was better. Now that I'm kind of rolling the new idea around in my head and how it's gonna keep me on that path or get me further down the road, I don't see it working. So I'll go back to the original idea. And I don't think across here, I've really made many changes from the original plan, like I said, tiny little course corrections, but nothing major. And it's like, so it's the plan in a lot of ways that's helping to maintain the ease of the painting. If I didn't have a plan, I was figuring it out, literally figuring it out, wherever I ended yesterday, I start the next day, trying to just figure out where to start without any, without any map, this would be, this would be impossible. So, um, and again, like, a big painting like this is a monumental task to handle mentally. There's so much being juggled. You don't start here. You start with small paintings and learn how to juggle two or three parts. And then you expand and learn how adding a fourth and a fifth element affects that. And you get settled into that and then you expand again. Now you're at seven or eight elements. And you can see the complexity, how they, it's, you know, it's not, it, it's not like you add in one part so it's one more part. You add in one part and it, it now interacts with the seven others. And so it's, it's not one new part. It's one part and how it affects everything and how it's, how it's affected by everything. So you slowly expand. But when you get into a painting like this, you've got to be able to see the whole painting and how you're then going to incrementally break it down to get there. And that includes what the value scale looks like. How colorful is it going to be? Right, because the painting at the end, how colorful and how bright and how sharp, and if you don't know that at the beginning, you're just gonna be at the whim of whatever the stroke you put down and let dry um, be. You're not gonna be able to then, like I said, for me, I don't want this painting tack sharp, which means every mark has to have the edge taken off of it. Every mark. But if I didn't know what I wanted, there's a very good chance that some of the things in the back will be very sharp right now and they'd be forcing my hand. So again, I have a whole, I have a long game, and then I've got the incremental steps along the way to get me there. Um, so uh, very quickly, do we have any questions?
We'll take a couple of minutes if anybody's got questions about what we're doing. Um, no? Well, connection is too spotty. Okay, well, and that's fine. Tomorrow noon, we'll get the face done. So uh, we will do our best to make sure that we've got much better internet for tomorrow. We'll try to avoid this nightmare that we had today. Um, but we'll be, we'll be knocking out the face tomorrow, and um, this painting's moving along beautifully. It's, it's actually a lot closer to completion than it, than it might seem at the moment. It's not far away from being done. So anyway, thank you everybody for coming in and thank you for bearing with us with the internet today. Uh, we, are real, we really do appreciate uh, you dealing with the, the in and out here, but um, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a wonderful night.